Чуть Good morning, everybody. Good morning. You're very welcome to today's conference. Um, my name is Derek Mitchell. I'm the CEO of IPOSI. And I don't think we've had a bigger conference, an IPOSI-focused conference uh, ever. Uh, we've had over 220 registrations today. And just looking at the, the breakdown, I think it's about 60% from patient communities. It's about 20% uh, from the scientific or academic community, another 15% from industry, and uh, spotted among you are people from state agencies and individual companies, data protection commissioner's office. Uh, so it's a real multi-stakeholder audience. So it's, uh, it's great to have that mix in the room because I certainly think today's topic of electronic health records, getting it right from the start, needs that multi-stakeholder uh, audience and today is all about starting conversations and continuing conversations beyond this room uh, because it's certainly something that IPOSI has targeted from the point of view of our annual theme in 2019 which is patient data uh, and certainly something we're looking to strengthen in terms of our own connectivity. Uh, people talk about the challenge of connectivity uh, when you're referring to electronic health records and I think IPOSI has a role to play in making connections between the different stakeholders but also about creating I think shared understanding about what we actually are talking about when we talk about electronic health records. So I'm going to introduce you to Sarah in a second. Sarah is our chair for the first session but I just wanted to welcome people and just get a few logistical things out of the way. So we have three doors to the room. Uh, the fire exit are out through those doors. There's the main exit uh, out through the, the foyer of the hotel. And there's also exits to your, your right and left. I feel like an air, ho air host at the moment. Uh, so, but suffice to say that we've had uh, a good start to today in terms of our 13th IPOSI annual general meeting, uh, ably led by uh, Ava Battles from the MS Society. Uh, our, our board chairperson, and we're extremely grateful to those board members for their dedication and time uh, in, in helping to, to really pursue the IPOSI objectives. Um, I'd like to, to, first of all, start by thanking the IPOSI staff and executive who have uh, been busy them, themselves not only this morning but in, for many weeks in the lead-up to today's event. And I'd certainly like to welcome our new communications manager, that's Debbie Hutchinson is standing at the back there. So Debbie uh, hasn't quite started yet, <laughs> uh, but is here today, and I hope everybody gets a chance to meet her. Debbie is replacing uh, Ken Rogan, who many of you will have known, I posey for, who was our comms manager for over five and a half years. And he's not gone very far. He's gone to Cancer Trials Ireland, so uh, he won't. I think Ken will be around uh, today as well. Um, but just a quick word on each of your chairs, you'll find the, uh, the program uh, and also our annual report, but also a terminology explained document that we've uh, been working on in the lead up to today's event. But we also hope we can build on going forward in terms of creating that shared understanding. I think any starting point should be uh, about what patients and patient communities need to know, first of all. But work on a shared understanding and move forward from that point. Because sometimes people can be talking about the same things, but can mean different things. So um, we hope that certainly helps to invigorate the discussions and doesn't leave any individual behind in terms of what we're talking about today. So, um, so today's first session is chaired ably by uh, Sarah McLaughlin. Sarah is a um, good friend of IPOSI. Uh, has come through the IPOSI patient education program. And I think, mm -hmm. um, if I remember correctly, it was a patient voice in cancer event a couple of years back where we met for the first yeah, time. Yeah, I think that was the first time uh, in UCD. Yeah, in mm -hmm. UCD. Um, so Sarah is uh, chairing our, our first event. And with that, I'll hand over mm -hmm. to Sarah. Thanks very much, Derek. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here today because we have a very interesting program where we hear from a range of voices about EHRs, and I think that's really important. 
Um, so to start off, we're going to have two talks in this session, um, from one from more of an Irish perspective and one from more of an international pr perspective focusing on clinical research. At the end of each of the talks, uh, if we have time, we'll have one question. Uh, if we don't have enough time or if there's more questions, we do have a Q&A session and a discussion session at the very end of this part of the day. Um, just in a, Not at the end of the day, but at the end of this session. So if you have questions, please hold on to them and we will get to them in the Q&A session. So after the two speakers, then we will have the fireside chat with patient representatives and there we'll have three great patient representatives who are going to talk us through their experiences and their thoughts on EHRs. Um, after that fireside chat, then I'll invite the two speakers from the earlier session to come up to the stage and we will have a full discussion with the fireside chat patients and uh, the speakers from the morning and you can really let loose on your Q&A then, all right? So that's the organisation for the session. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. It's great to see such a range of people in the audience as well. Um, so on to our speakers. Our first speaker is Vincent Jordan. So Vincent is uh, from the HSE and his current role there is as a delivery director for um, ICT systems within the acute hospitals connected with the office of the CIO within the HSE. So he has an extensive background in IT and he joined the HSE a few years ago and since then he's been involved in various health information systems at various stages from strategy and planning right up into implementation. And today he's going to talk to us about EHRs in Ireland and where are we now. Thank you, Vincent. I have control here, yeah. Yeah, okay, super. Yeah, so thank you very much, um, Sarah. I'll, I'll stay near the mic, okay? All right. So thank you, Sarah, and thanks for the invitation, Derek, to, to talk here. Um, so I just, uh, I'm going to really talk about three sort of areas. I'm going to give you a bit of background. I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are on the EHR journey and talk a little bit about how we move forward from here. So some of that is really uh, centered on people that we have and the program we're making and the learning that we're doing on this journey. Okay. So um, just a little bit uh, more background to me. Um, as Sarah says, I'm the delivery director for acute hospitals. I, I live on the wild Atlantic Way, and it's great to see some fellow Galwegians here as well, uh, Neil from Cree. Um, this is a picture of the um, national park there in Connemara. Okay? So whilst we, we live on that exposed west coast, we do get to appreciate some of the more refined culture on the east coast. And I spend a lot of my time here in Dublin working with uh, various partners on the acute hospitals. Okay. Um, the, the set of work that we're involved in in the um, ICT enablement for acute hospitals, there's a couple of hundred projects, some very big ones and some smaller ones. There's a project value of around 150 million euros, um, a rolling project budget of that sort of order. Okay. And the EHR is a really important element of that. And indeed, all of the things that we're doing are contributing towards that agenda. Okay. So just as we get into the discussion, I want to just make sure it's grounded in the, the experience of healthcare delivery. And just a day in the life of the HSE is really painted out here. So there's nearly 160,000 prescriptions issued every single day. Okay? Um, there's disability assistance hours of about 12,000 hours every day. Um, there's um, 48 urgent breast cancer appointments every day. Okay, now each of these initiatives and everything else that's not described here is actually supported and enabled by some underlying technology. Okay, so we've got lots of technology that helps ensure we're delivering care and delivering care in an effective and safe way. Okay, we've always got room to improve. Just looking specifically then at the acute area. This includes obviously all of the work in the publicly funded hospitals here in the country, um, but also the National Ambulance Service and Organ Donation Ireland and things like that. So just to pull out one of those, there, um, last year um, we saw 832 ambulance calls every single day. And we've had a very big technology platform introduced to support the ambulance services. So obviously the call handling, the dispatch services, We've got an incredible networked platform inside the ambulances now, and all of the emergency medicine um, technicians will be are, or are using a tablet to document the patient care. They're using an electronic record 
in the um, emergency medical technician community right now. That has been underway for about five years. We get to the very last of the ambulance centers in the next couple of months. They're actually coming out into the west. So everywhere, it started in the south, we've gone all through the Leinster area, and then we're just finishing out in the west right now. And the complexity of delivering that and all of the issues that arise and working those through is part of the journey that we're on, okay? And um, we do this journey in the light of something that's of enormous interest to all of us here. These are just the last two front pages that before I had to put the deck together. But there is rarely a day when health is not on the front page in some shape or form. And that's because we're all vested in that. And so we've got a spotlight on our work. It's because we're all vested in that work. And it's how we approach that that delivers additional value is really important, OK? Because it's important to all of us as stakeholders in the health system. And obviously, it's critically important for me, responsible to, for delivering many of the systems that will help people deliver improved care, OK? So I just want to come in then around actually the uh, patient records and the electronic health record and talk a little bit about where we are in that uh, particular journey. Um, the policy landscape is one that um, historically there was very little mention of ICT. There was some ICT-related uh, papers and policy, but what we've started to see is more and more um, ICT enablement forming part of that policy initiative. Okay, so the trauma networks, it's embedded within that policy that we actually have ICT enablement there. The acute floor, which is a new way to handle emergency presentations, ICT is embedded within that. So we establish the programs to ensure we're delivering the capabilities that will allow for that safe and effective care. Okay. Um, it all, on the, the in terms of that ICT agenda becoming a key part of the way we deliver healthcare, it's really rooted in this paper, which was the Future Health paper. Um, it was published in um, the end of 2012, but the development was a few years leading into that. And this, I think, was the first time where we saw a really coherent um, appreciation of where ICT can actually enable um, effective care. And they talk about e-health. This is probably the first time I saw the term e-health within the, um, the policy literature. Okay? And it spoke about that requirement to bring together the academic the um, industry and the care delivery organizations to actually get onto a better platform and a better route forward. And I think that what's happening here within IPOSI is a really good reflection of bringing those multiple stakeholders together and move it forward. This was really the seed that led to some of the dialogue in the Slaunch Care um, Committee, the, the Future Health Committee, that resulted in eHealth being a major thread across the Slauncher Care Deliverables, okay? So this was the seed. It, it um, established the role of a chief information officer in the HSE, which brought us through into that dialogue with the um, cross-party committee and the deliverables that have been set out in the Slauncher Care Plan, okay? It is wonderful to have this plan that gives us a multi-year perspective and a strong sense of how ICT is going to enable care improvement and care delivery, okay? And it is, it is really a, a testament to our Oireachtas that they brought this together and pulled it off because some of the challenges um, that come with different party perspectives have been reconciled in this agenda, okay? So it's a really fantastic policy platform and implementation plan that's gonna help bring much better tools and solutions for the people that deliver care. So just calling out where eHealth fits within it, um, there's a work stream, and under the work stream one, which is about enabling infrastructure, it talks to the eHealth program, and there's a, there's a whole set of deliverables within that that we work with Laura McGahey in the um, Slauncher Care Program Implementation Office with. Okay, So that's the context within which we're working. But that context, I guess, is also grounded in all of the developments that we've been um, working on over many years, okay? Um, and and I, I suppose I should call out the terminology. It's, it's a really useful artifact to see this. Um, it's, it's very useful because, I guess, the, tech, the language that we speak can often be uh, somewhat confusing. I know that there was a little bit of hesitancy about what was um, the description for the shared care record, but whoever put that first paragraph together, I think, nailed it in one. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So I, I, I don't know that there was a need for that hesitancy, really. But 
what it's really grounded in are some of the big initiatives, some of the very significant care improvement initiatives that we've been delivering over a period of years. And I'm just going to talk to two of those examples because these have been things that have taught us very much about how do we reach that better place for care. The first one I want to talk about is the um, blood track system. So this was a, a new directive that required a traceability from donor to recipient of blood products which came in about, um, well, in excess of 12 years ago. It was a European directive. Um, and we've brought in a platform now which allows that traceability from the donor right through the person that needs it. And blood products are needed in every single facility, every health facility, every acute health facility in the country. Okay, so for, um, for surgical procedures, for maternity care, there's blood products right across the, the um, services that are offered. And what's happened through this tooling, which was led by um, Tony Finch, who worked with the Blood Transfusion Board, what's happened is we've now got, we've now moved to a point where we've got one of the optimum blood product delivery networks in Europe, okay? So every unit is traced from donor right through to its end use. There's a whole set of safety checks along the way, and that whole community of laboratory technicians, sorry, laboratory uh, professionals that support that delivery of blood product and matching the right blood product, the right unit to the right patient, has been enabled by this platform. And there's so many safety checks along the way because it needs to be temperature controlled, and it needs to be properly matched. And this, as I said, has resulted in us having an optimum um, blood product delivery network here in Ireland. And we've got, that network has been actually about changing the way we manage blood products. When I first started in the health system um, about 16 years ago, one of my early interactions with the laboratory included the um, person responsible for the blood bank. And he was just writing the order to the um, blood transfusion board, which was going to be faxed up, and those blood products were going to come down on fast track. Does anybody remember fast track? <coughs> yeah, the CIE um, parcel service. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and he would actually go down to the station to actually collect those blood products and bring them back. We have moved into a completely different environment now, one which is much safer for patients. And that has only happened because of the change in the way business is done. And the change in the way business is done was enabled by these technology platforms, okay? There's a new um, uh, feature just coming down the track. It's, it's effectively, the, for all intents and purposes, it's like a chocolate vending machine, but it's actually blood units. And this will actually further improve the delivery system for blood products and will allow for, again, optimal use and minimum stocking levels that provide for safe care. So there's some really fantastic innovation happening here, all enabled by that platform. The second one, and um, 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 it's, it's the national imaging platform. How many people have come across this in some shape or form? Okay, so it's, it's one you're very familiar with. Um, I, I met Neil, who, as I was on the way in, I didn't realize Neil would be here, but um, I did say I was going to talk about this. If I'd realized he was going to be here, I wouldn't have um, further flattered him, really. But what we've delivered, or what Neil delivered through the National Imaging Platform, and that continues to be sustained with a, a, a really fantastic team of professionals here, is that ability to look at those radiology diagnostics across the country. This kind of... Uh, technology enablement has done all sorts of things for the radiology service but what it's really done for the patient is it means that when a patient needs an escalation in care the people that have got the expertise to deliver that can make sure they can see it from any facility in the country and say yes transferring that patient to me is going to ensure that individual gets the right care at the right time okay so this again a very significant investment at a time when we were um, under the, the um, Troika, okay? But we've put in um, a very significant investment to put this platform in place, and it is actually transforming the experience of care for many, many patients. They're getting safer, more effective care as a result of this platform. So here's two examples of those very many programs that we have underway that are contributing towards that effective information that allows the care delivery people and the individuals that receive care to get safe and effective care at every step along the way, okay? It's a real challenge though, and the Robert Wachter, does anybody, anybody come across Robert Wachter? 
Yeah, okay. Do anybody know the, the publication that released recently came out? Yeah, Digital Doctor. Has anybody read the book? Yeah, okay, right. Really superb book about the complexity of technology in healthcare. And he has a, a case that threads through that story, which is really illuminating that sometimes we trade certain um, risks for care delivery now for new risks, and we need to be very watchful of that. But Robert Wachter was invited into the NHS to help them with their um, digitization agenda, really. And one of the things that he calls out in the report is that the investment can take a long time to realize value. I think NIMIS is, and um, the blood track systems are probably different in that respect, in that there were some things about that that allowed us to displace significant cost. Okay? But for many of our investments, it takes a long time to yield the benefits because the benefits only come when we change the way we receive and we deliver care. Okay. And that was, uh, that's uh, the way uh, the WACTA report articulates that, I think, is really telling. So one of the things, and, and the reason, I guess, that uh, Fran Thompson, the CIO for the HSE, who was um, very much looking forward to speaking here, he's down with public and expenditure and reform right now, looking for some of the additional investments that we need to be able to continue this journey. Okay. So that's the, the context within which we are um, uh, working Okay, we've got to make those investments. We've got to make sure the people come together, not just the technologists. And in fact, probably the technologists play the um, the smallest role in the improvements in care delivery. What the um, people that receive care and deliver care can do is they can change the way they um, operate. That brings about new efficiencies and new capabilities and new safety mechanisms. Okay, so that's the. Um, that's the context in which we work. And in this process, there's a lot of learning goes through. So one of the things that we identified in the Future Health Report was the need for a chief clinical information officer. Okay? And the HSC has a post there. It's just in the final stages of appointing again. Okay? And that's to actually lead out from a clinical perspective on the electronic health record agenda. Okay? And these professionals that are... are um, delivering care bring such a richness to this process and they can focus the attention in the things that are really going to make a difference. Okay. Along with that, we're seeing a partnering with those people that are in the, um, uh, well, those of us that have conditions that we want to um, uh, get care for. Okay. I was at um, something that was convened uh, with the diabetes clinical lead uh, just a couple of years ago, and I think there's a lot of work in public patient involvement in that program, and I know that Cree facilitate much of that. Um, but what was really interesting is the individuals in the room said, well, actually, we're the people with the expertise, the care professionals are the specialists. Okay? And so the experts are the people that live with the conditions, and the specialists are the ones that help them on that journey. Okay. And I think that we're starting to see now some additional involvement with the, um, uh, the, the citizenship and, and the, the, the general public around that. So moving forward and the public patient involvement, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what we've done so far in that. Okay? And we are um, um, what we're coming to in the next uh, year as well. So over the last 12 months, there's been a number of engagements um, with the, uh, well, via the National Advocacy Unit, and we've had 18 members of a public involvement panel came together, okay? They've been involved in a number of workshops so far. Um, a little bit about the, um, how we engage and how they can contribute to the EHR agenda. Um, the, the persona workshop, and the personas are really these exemplars, these are the kind of fictional characters that represent how things will be different when there's good um, ICT-enabled tools available to the individuals and to the people that provide care services. Okay? So these personas have been uh, fleshed out and developed in conjunction with the public consultation panel. Um, there was a workshop held just a couple of months ago around the clinical portal, which is um, kind of strongly came out in support of direct patient access 
for um, the uh, health records and we, we didn't expect anything different. That's, that's what we absolutely expected and it was great to get that affirmed. And also appropriate sharing of that data amongst people that are delivering care in different contexts. Okay? And that again is very welcome to have that strong endorsement of sharing data where that is in the patient's interests. Okay, so they're the workshops that we've conducted. We are um, hoping, if everything goes well, to have a further detailed workshop on the data privacy engagement. Okay, um, and that's that's going to be held before the year end. All right, and and this I think is a really important part that will help inform our roadmap. So we need to make sure that what we progress are things that are lined up with everybody's expectations about when data can be shared, how the controls and the safety mechanisms are in place so that only appropriate sharing takes place and that's done within the context of a consultation with the public. Okay, So um, into next year then, we're going to be looking at the shared record, the um, acute EHR patient portal, and some work around the community EHR. Okay, so that's the that's the context of the the workshops that are coming up over the next twelve months as well. Uh, just very briefly, this is the the word cloud from the last workshop on the patient portal. Um, in terms then of the the um, the all singing all dancing solution to all of our clinical problems and um, EHR, what we've got uh, and and um, what we what we have in flight is a program of work that was agreed by cabinet that focuses the initial EHR deployment in the children's hospital, okay? So that's what the, the current government focus and government priority is set out at, that we acquire an EHR for the children's hospital. Um, the initial market engagement started a couple of weeks ago on that and a procurement process is in flight, okay? So that's where the initial focus for the acute EHR is going to be. In parallel with that, we've got a series of learning exercises where we're looking to bring through a proposal around the shared record. This is about us exposing digital data. I don't expect you to be able to read this. Um, what we're looking at is using existing information sources that can be combined together to present a shared view of the patient's digital data, okay? And within that, we've got a number of experiments around the clinical capabilities, which are across the top line, and then the enabling works on the bottom line. And the main part of that enabling works is that data privacy work. So what we can do, or what we have to do, is we have to make sure we stay lined up with the data privacy agenda. There are some things coming through the um, Department of Health in terms of a new statutory instrument that informs how patient data can be shared. Okay, So we're trying to keep the enablement and the legislation and the patient demand working together. Okay, And so this is where a lot of focus will be over the next couple of years around bringing together the information sources we have around patient data and presenting that in a coherent way to improve care. Okay, um, And that's largely... Um, the, the work that we have underway, it is clearly enabled by really good clinicians that understand the bridge between their clinical work and the ICT enablement, partnered with some of the ICT professionals and partnered with the investors, right, the government that is a key stakeholder in this. Okay? And together, we're making really good progress in some spaces. We're starting to identify the areas where additional progress will be made. But I have to say it's, it's an area of work that is incredibly rewarding, incredibly challenging, um, but it is fantastic when we see care change for the benefit of the individuals that come to us for care. And I think that's the, that's the I guess, the, the joy of working in the health system. Okay, so thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much, Vincent. Um, do we have time for just one quick question, if anybody? Will we keep it? All right, we'll keep it for the discussion. We'll move on. Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, okay, so our, our next speaker is uh, Deepak Kalra. Uh, so Deepak has um, quite, a, quite a range of experience in EH EHRs, and he's going to bring us through um, a really nice talk today about uh, 
the clinical research aspect of EHRs and how they're so useful. So he has um, a variety of experience in this from developing new uh, data, helping supporting people to develop data for EHRs, but also on the other side to developing new ways of um, dealing with high quality data and trying to find new uses for it. Uh, so he has a, a range of um, appointments as well. So alongside um, academic positions with UCL and the University of Ghent, He's also the founder and the president of the European, European Institute for Innovation through Health Data. Um, so, do you back to us? All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you very much to Iposi for inviting me to speak to you uh, about this subject. And before you kind of switch off and say, oh, research, what a dull subject, that's really for academics to write papers, let's actually have a quick snooze. Um, I'd like to wake you up a little bit um, <clears throat> and say that actually research is not about writing papers. It's about discovering insights that allow us to do healthcare better. Now, I've taken these bullet points as examples from Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente is a very integrated environment in the US where they have primary and secondary services all harmonized and where they actually have the ability to affect change. So what I want you to see is that these are not research results. This slide is not telling you what were the insights. This slide is telling you when you use your data to develop insights, and you use those insights to transform how you deliver care, what happens to the patients? What happens to the real humans? The answer is sometimes they don't die. This is serious, high impact, societally relevant learning from data. So please switch into that mentality rather than academics writing papers, although of course academics do have to write papers. Why is it so important that we learn from our data? <clears throat> because actually we have a lot of knowledge gaps. This chart is just showing you <coughs> that as we age, and I'm doing so, and I'm on this chart somewhere, you start to collect diseases. And the reason you collect them is because the first one doesn't kill you anymore. Thanks to advances, you, you live on and get the second and the third and the fourth. And our problem is nearly all of our scientific knowledge comes from single disease silos. That is, we have clinical guidelines in single diseases, our drugs are developed through clinical studies looking at single diseases. So most of what we know about how to deliver good care is learned from single diseases. <clears throat> but that is not what Europe looks like today. We have a lot of learning to do. The other thing is we have a lot of learning to do from each other. There's a lot of fine print. You can't read the fine print from the back and because it's quite a wide room. I'm not terribly sure how well you can read the fine print from the sides of this auditorium, but you don't have to read. You just have to notice there are bunches of orange bars not of the same length. And that means that different countries are having different successes with how they look after patients with heart failure. So we have an obligation not only to learn from our data, but to share our learning, to learn from each other and improve practice. So that is the spirit with which I want you to think about health data. It's an obligation for us to say, how are you achieving better outcomes than me? What are you doing right that I'm not doing? And it takes a humility, of course, but it takes a spirit of sharing and learning together from our data. This is the cycle, this is from Chuck Friedman, the, perhaps the grandfather, I think he wouldn't be offended if I, he's older than me, I, he wouldn't mind being called a grandfather, I think, of the learning health system. It's an international movement, our institute is part of that movement. It's about working together on a cycle where we learn from our data, we do things differently, the data therefore changes because it now reflects a different way of delivering care. And so from the new data, we learn again whether we've got things right or not right. And so the concept of research in this ecosystem is not 
limited to any one of those many granularities that exist, whether it's learning about small numbers of patients that allows a single care provider to be a bit smarter <coughs> in how they deliver care, or whether it's looking at <coughs> multi-millions of patients in order to develop a new drug, optimize an algorithm. It doesn't matter. They're all important. They all have value. And we need to mutually respect all of the actors in the landscape who are in the learning ecosystem. They're all contributing. Sometimes a discovery can be implemented as a change within months within a single care organization or a group of patients who get given an app to allow them to do something more autonomously in a great way. Or it can be 15 years to develop a brand new drug for a disease that's proving to be a real issue for a set of po patients with the disease. The timing, the geographical distribution of the knowledge is not important. What matters is the spirit of always looking to learn from our data. So when we speak as an institute with our healthcare providers, what do we hear? They are, as an example, a hospital, but it isn't only a hospital. What are they wanting to see as their ambition? They want to see that rather than getting paid for physical activity, that the payment model, the reimbursement model, the reward model, the recognition model, the value model for an organization is about the impact they've had on real people. They want to use their knowledge to optimize care pathways to get the best outcomes, but mindful of the resource implications. How can they be efficient and yet deliver better care? Can they be more integrated? There's a real hunger. No, that's the wrong word. Frustration. There's a real pain and suffering in healthcare providers about the lack of ability to integrate, to connect. These multiple chronic diseases mean that we need to link primary and secondary care, link specialties, connect to social care, connect to patients and bring them in. Great frustration at that. They want to be on a learning and improving cycle. And when we get hospitals outside of their competitive space, you bring them at a European level together where they're surrounded by peers who are not an immediate neighbor of theirs, they're really open to learning and sharing their problems and their issues. They do want to be more research active. They see the spirit and culture of learning right across the research spectrum as being a healthy culture in their organizations. And they really do want to share good practice. Now, you can't do any of that unless you have a good EHR that contains reusable data. And by EHR, I don't mean the silo in one organization. I mean the patient-centric universe of knowledge about what's happening to a patient's health and health care. That is the EHR I'm talking about. Then you jump quickly to the scientific dimension, and I won't build all these points, and I'm not going to go through them all. But if you look just as an example at life sciences and medicines development, what would you do, colleagues in that sector, if you had better access to data? And here is a short list of a long list of possibilities that their eyes are open to. Many, many things. And I don't think you would look at that list and say, that's terrible. I don't want any of those things to happen. These are things that lead to better medicines, better devices, maybe better algorithms in the future, ways of improving the way we deliver care. These are great things. Critical success factor, high quality reusable EHR data. You get my punchline, don't you? So what are we trying to do about that? So I'm gonna give you just two little brief windows at a European level. One is a project that I had the privilege of leading called EHR for CR. It's finished, it's done and dusted. Um, what it did was to look at how can we connect a set of hospitals, it was working with hospitals at that time, and analyze the data in those hospitals in order to find out what patients might be most suitable to a clinical trial that's in design. So firstly, if you discover what kind of patients exist, you can design the trial better so it's much more likely to recruit and be effective and be fast and get a successful drug out to the real world more quickly. It's about accelerating innovations in treatment. 
but also it avoids a lot of wastage because you end up otherwise taking a long time to do a trial, and that adds to the cost of the drug, which makes it less affordable to health systems. So there are some really good benefits with this. Um, what we did was we developed an environment that would work for this purpose. So if you take in that dotted line um, uh, an imaginary hospital which has its EHR, you export the data into a separate clinical data warehouse which is just the minimal data you need for this purpose, anonymous data, and you connect only that to a central platform that runs queries. And that central platform <coughs> helps a researcher to be able to find out about the distribution of patients without any identifiers. They only get aggregate patient counts. It tells them how many people in this hospital could be eligible to your trial if you design it the way you're planning. Okay, not enough. All right, tweak your design, change your criteria slightly, <coughs> and what happens? The numbers go up. You keep iterating until you know you've got a viable trial, and then you can run it. Robust security, this was designed, this whole architecture was designed pre-GDPR, but we knew it was coming, and it's fully GDPR compliant. So a person doing research can then, externally to the environment, can run better trials. But that last little arrow that I built is a different message there is therefore also a tool for a hospital use to allow it to understand its own data. And we are just starting now to see, because this is being rolled out commercially, we are starting to see some hospitals starting to use the tool to do their own internal research in order to help either improve care or to advance <coughs> academic research at a very, very low cost. So this really helps to accelerate our learning right across the ecosystem. Um, as an example, a, research, a researcher composing a trial or a study would have a screen that allows them to author some eligibility criteria. This is a set of diabetes criteria. Doesn't matter what they are, they can hit run and they can get back a kind of spread of how many places across Europe that are connected might have the relevant patients and, and they can fine tune and iterate that. In case you ask, before we got too far on the design, we ran some really extensive studies across Europe, consulting with ethics committees, consulting with patient organizations to find out would this be acceptable. This is just one chart of many but I hope you can read enough to see that when it's done in a GDPR-compliant, aggregate data-only way, patients are positive about this kind of way of improving and accelerating research. Now let's look at big data for a minute. <coughs> if you go to the big data story, this is just an example of four bullet points, four simple examples of discoveries you can make when you're looking at a million or more patients. Because you can then start to narrow down your field to look for unusual things. That in a database of a thousand people, you might not have one or you might have one. You can't tell if it's a pattern. Until you have enough, you can't determine if there's a pattern here. When you go plus to a, a beyond a million, you can start to make some really important discoveries. Now, these are not immediately transforming a person's life, but they are unlocking an opportunity to discover how to advance the practice of medicine or therapeutics so that we can, in the future, do that. This is a European project, just on one slide, called EDEN. It's about a year into a five-year program, and they are out looking for healthcare provider organizations that want to connect. Rather like the previous diagram, this is all about building an architecture that looks after privacy robustly. This is a complete GDPR landscape, fully compliant. And what happens is researchers are able to run queries on aggregate data, and the network they want to, they would love to have 100 or more sites across Europe 
maybe more than that. And there is a budget to connect to those sites. The sites get a budget to help them hand-holding with connecting. So if any of you are sitting in the driving seat of a healthcare provider organization, probably at this stage the scale that's needed is a hospital. Apologies to GP colleagues in the audience. Um, if you're sitting there saying, hey, we could connect to something like that, we'd be interested in being part of a party of shared experiences, shared learning. Eden is the key word to look for. I'm sure if you Google it, it's unique. <coughs> I'd also like to turn attention to nations. This is only one slide of an example. In Germany, there is an ambitious program that's now also about a year in to say, can we grow the capability within a country to be more learning health system orientated. So there are four regional epicenters. I say epicenters because it's not one site. It's a cluster of sites at a regional level that have each taken some disease areas and said, how can we organize it so the EHRs collect data, even if they're different systems, collect data in a more standardized way that we have legitimate I mean, Germany is not a pushover for GDPR, as you can guess, nor is Ireland, by the way. Um, you know, how can we pool the analysis data in order to learn things and translate that back? So four learning health system ecosystems in Germany. There are other countries. I haven't got another dozen slides with other countries, but there are similar slides for many other countries. It's sometimes easier to proceed nationally than internationally to get buy-in, to get comfort. So it's a really important opportunity also when developing a national EHR to plug in a learning health system ecosystem so that you actually make sure you build in from the ground up continuous learning cycles. So where are we? We are at a stage where, excitingly enough, the data appetite, the need to learn from clinical research and healthcare are converging. We actually all, and I'm not going to speak to all these points. I'd love to read out all those bullet points because they're a bit small, but I can't do that in the time Derek's given me. Um, I'll have to be a bit mindful of that. So I want you to just realize that if you bring these worlds together, and that's one of our ambitions as an institute, if you bring them together, they reach a really powerful critical mass to affect change. We can't have silos of research and silos of care come together, share all of the momentum, all of the capability to make the data really deliver. So we work and we would commend any program to bring together the actors who somewhere touch the learning health ecosystem and go into co-creation mode. Bring everyone together, work together in order to visualize the capture and sharing of better quality health data, and then its trustworthy use and reuse for smarter healthcare and efficient research. We are working on a few particular stumbling blocks. What makes it hard to achieve that today? One of those, as you know, is interoperability. There are lots of technical interoperability standards. If you look at this slide and look at the right-hand side of this slide, we do it very well. We at an international level, produce lots of technical standards. We are absolutely terrible at the left-hand side of this slide. We do not bring the stakeholders together to say, what do we want to prioritize? How do we want to shape clinical data so it's meaningful and useful to us? And there are four actor categories on the left-hand side of this slide. And you will find clinician involvement is reasonable. Public health involvement is a little. Research involvement has its own silo of standards. Patient involvement is zero. It is zero globally. Terrible, isn't it? What good is it being able to share the data if the quality is not good enough? One of the big challenges with reusing health data is that it's a bit scrappy. It's a bit sporadic. People are entering data. So we've done a lot of work to say, what are the qualities of data that make its use trustworthy? And can we help, as an example, a hospital to understand its own data quality? So this is a very beautiful slide. I'm not planning to talk you through all these lovely images. Just imagine, though, 
just take the radius diagram. If you knew from a set of quality indicators where your hospital was and where you were weak, we can start to think, what are your systematic errors? Does it lie in your EHR system, not really meeting the needs of today? Or does it lie in the culture of data entry that the hospital is not doing right to help make it work? So we're, it's really important that we look after that topic. Just in my last minute, one minute, I'd like to also invite you to take a look at this URL, and I think the slides will be available later. Connected Health Cities has done some really nice work in the north of England looking at how can the public be brought on board with everything I've just been saying about really championing the use of data, not reluctantly saying, oh, yeah, you can use my data. No, get on with it. Get on and do these great things with the data. That's what we need to hear. We need to be deafened by the sound. Get on with it. And so this is a fantastic piece of work to help look at what are the things the public most care about as acceptance criteria. And I'd like to now close by saying we are part of Data Saves Lives. You've seen from, from the slide that was flashing up on the background when Derek was on stage and that lovely, nice, long thing that people are carrying around the room. Data Saves Lives is, is an initiative uh, in which Yaposi is a strong player along with us to try to help the public understand effectively what I've been saying in this talk because we want them to understand why and how it's important to use data wisely and well and how it can be done in trustworthy GDPR compliant ways. So really I feel this audience has tremendous power. Uh, I understand a really high percentage of patient representatives in this room. You are our positive disruptive influence bottom up. Get on with it, please. Help us all to get on with making good use of data. Thank you. Thanks very much. No, I think we'll, no there isn't time for questions, but we'll, we'll get questions later on in the discussion. Okay, so thanks very much to our great speakers this morning, and I'd like to invite um, our patient representatives up to the stage. Okay, sorry. That's it over here. It's okay. And we give out these. Thanks. Okay. Um, now, welcome everyone to our fireside chat. Um, so we've got three really great patients here for today. Um, I'll start off with Oh, I sit in the middle. Okay, so keep it all together. <laughs> um, so I'll start off with uh, Sheila. So Sheila Fitzgerald is from Kerry. Um, she has a background in nursing. I know her through the IPOSI patient education program that we did, the, the pilot program together. Um, so in 2015, Sheila was diagnosed with MS. And since then, she has brought her, both her professional background and her patient experience together um, to really work through and strengthen her patient advocacy that she's involved in. Uh, she's been involved in a few EHR um, initiatives uh, with the HC of the Department of Health um, as the patient representative, bringing the patient's voice into the development of EHRs. Um, so Jackie is also, Jackie Brown is also from Kerry. We've got a strong Kerry uh, <laughs> component here today. <laughs> Um, and Jackie has over 30 years experience in disability, activism and equality. Um, she has also been through uh, patient ex uh, education experience with the UPATI program. And that's through this that I know um, Jackie. Um, she's been involved in numerous boards and committees and been a member of lots of organizations with her act through her activism. And she's also involved uh, as a patient representative in um, EHR development within the HFC and Department of Health. And then uh, last but not least, we have Caroline Murphy. Uh, so Caroline's from Dundalk and she got involved with EHRs through her experience with her son 
Uh, so Caroline's son was uh, diagnosed with epilepsy after an illness when he was six. He's now 18. So he, she has uh, extensive experience of being involved in his care uh, from uh, childhood to transition to an adult. Um, and she's been fostering very strong relationships with um, the medical professionals. Um, so she has experience uh, with EHRs as being one of the few people in Ireland that has been involved in EHR already uh, through the Epilepsy Lighthouse Project, and she can tell us more about that. So, um, so I'll start off with a question for Caroline. Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about how you feel that EHRs can benefit the patient from your own experience and from what you've seen? Obviously, uh, you know, as a parent of a, a child with an ongoing illness, anything that can help his care, I want to be involved in. 11 years, I suppose, in pediatric services where the hospital was small, we were known very well, we had built up wonderful relationships. And then the thought for many years even before that of having to move to this whole big bad world of adult services was always going to be a worry for me. Um, so then we, I, we got involved in a transition program, which was wonderful as a parent. But for my son to get to know what it was going to be like in transitioning into adult, that he needed to take more you know, care for, of himself, that he needed to be more control of his illness, that it was now, you know, it wasn't mommy that should be getting his medicines and all the rest. So that was all very much. And it was only later when we moved to the hospital, I thought, but what about his records? He was so well prepared in, okay, when you meet the consultant now, it's, he's going to talk to you. He's not going to talk to your mom anymore. You have to have your um, questions all put out beforehand. You have to prepare for this 10-minute slot that you will get in the hospital. So you need to be. So, you know, that was it. And then it was only, I was thinking, but what about his records? I mean, he has had a long illness of, you know, 11 years we've been to, um, so many hospitals, we've seen so many different doctors, we've so many different areas of his care. I have seven or eight copybooks full of the information. And then I go and I'm asked, well, when did he have his first VNS battery put in? Oh, quick, which copy is that in? Um, you know, what about, wh when was he on the ketogenic diet? Because he has done all these things. And again, where is this information for me? In my copies somewhere, you know? And I suppose, you know, as a a mother who's a little bit OTT with my son, is, it's fine. But I'm thinking now he's 18, he's going to be moving on and he needs care for himself too and to know. And what if he does want to travel, which I hope he will do. He needs something that he can take with him that lists because as you can imagine, with a long-term illness like this, he has been on every anti-epileptic medicine that there is. He's I said, had a VNS, he's had, you know. so. He needs to be able, he's not going to remember these things. It's enough for him to try and remember to take his tablets morning and night. And so it's become very important for me that Sean will have this information at his disposal. And uh, so then when I was invited to get involved with the Lighthouse problem, Project, sorry, it was, yeah, great, fantastic. This is something that is badly needed. Now, I probably, I, I might say I'm the worst to get involved, but maybe also the better because I hate technology. I absolutely hate iPhones. I hate anything to do with it. So, you know, they really have to sell this to me as something that, you know, a dummy's guide to e-records are needed because I'm really scared of, you know, off all this. So maybe I'm the perfect person. But certainly seeing what is available and what can be done and you know and I was very interested in your talk too that tracking illnesses and I just see that there has to be a way to maybe for you know Sean's been on all these medicines they didn't work but maybe another study will come up with and that there is so much information that can be shared that is there but it, it needs to be easy to get at it needs to be um, updated but it also needs I talked earlier you know about Sean going to his appointments it's not enough for him to prepare, I think, too, this is where the clinician needs to quickly in look into Sean's records and see, all oh, right, what kind of a month did you have or since I've seen you last, what, that all of that should be there because, as I say, you have a 10-minute appointment. So to, for both the patient and the clinician to get the most out of it, that, you know, this is where the e-portal can really, you know, should be of benefit to both 
Um, and I think you know there is fantastic work certainly done on the, the epilepsy um, portal, and there are so many areas. But you know, again, it needs all his records need to be there um, and training. So yeah, yeah, that, that's great. Thank you, Caroline. So it really is not just on a healthcare side of things, but how it um, enables patients to really get on with the rest of their lives in ways that they don't have to be keeping track of things. They yes. can gives them a bit of freedom there. Yes, to the truth. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so um, the next qu question will be for uh, Jackie, and we want to ask you about how EHRs can improve care and safety for patients. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, thank you to the pr two previous speakers. First of all, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm coming at this from um, um, the point of view of great hope, expectation. And for me, this is, as a patient, this is about improving my quality of life, giving me back time in my daily life that I don't have to spend keeping records. I could fill this room at least with my medical history. I've had more than 38, 39 surgeries. And apart from my age alone, I have a number of comorbidities. So my big problem is I am living with the reality of going to clinicians, experts in this country, elsewhere. I've had treatment in Germany, in Singapore, um, and most of my treatment's been in this country. But I'm still operating in silos. So I'm going around the country, mostly, bringing my data, my information, and updating all the clinicians I meet, because they don't know what the other is saying. When they prescribe something for me, I say, well, what about the interaction of that drug with this drug? I've had some adverse reactions to drugs because of lack of information. I have taken personal responsibility for managing my health. And I'm lucky I have, A, the personal resources, the capacity, the willingness, and, and I don't get emotional about it. So I'm a very factual person, and just for the fun of it, I'm not obviously going to share it with you, but I have my eight-page summary medical record here in my hand. So that's what I now have in my Dropbox for when I go to visit. Because any time I end up in the hospital, which on average is once every three months because of one of my comorbidities, they start asking you your medical history. And I just kind of cry. I say, first of all, you have it. So, well, what date was that surgery? I now begin to mix up the dates of which surgery. I could tell you the number of hips and knees and shoulders I've had, but I, I myself can't remember exactly which year or which date. So I, I say, don't you look at this? Here you go. There it is. I can email it to you as well if you want. I want to share my record. It's not just about me wanting to share, but I want to see this happen in this country. But the design of it has to be right. The burden is becoming too much for me, the older I guess. We need a shared medical record. With all the data provisions, with all that, I have absolute faith in the GDPR process and the data management of it. No difficulty with that but patients must be involved from the start. And I absolutely am very pleased to hear you say it, Deepak, patient engagement is not happening in this country sufficiently. I, I've been at one, one meeting in the HSE, the national meeting, in one year. That is not patient engagement. We can keep this. Thank you very much, Jackie, that's fine. Thanks. Um, I guess it's really coming through strongly that patients really do want to be involved and they are invested in this obviously in many ways um, and they have voices that they actually want to be heard. Right. Um, so now we'll talk to Sheila about our next question and it kind of bridges the gap between the paper and the electronic and it's a question really about is everything all sorted once we go electronic or is there an underlying current of change that needs to happen as well? I think patients want to engage, uh, you know, and they want their to exercise their human rights to autonomy and self-determination. I think that's really important. I think information is key in this, and I think they need open access to their healthcare records. <coughs> I think there has been some cultural change in Ireland um, involving more patient engagement, but I think a lot more has to occur. Um, I think if we are going to have an adequate system that works with electronic um, healthcare records, if we're going to implement Sloan to care, if we're going to have patient-centered care, then this needs to happen. You know, 
I think technology in the form of electronic records may enable things, but it will not cause the cultural change to happen of itself. And I think that is really important. Um, I think patients are concerned that electronic patient records will deliver better, safer care. That is their primary concern. I say, and they're right to be concerned because we know that one in 10 patients in a hospital suffer an adverse event. And the World Health Organization, looking at this statistic, has said that the, the gr greater patient involvement is a key to safer care. Um, they have also pointed out that patient involvement is not expensive and it delivers economic results as well as improved care. So you would wonder in a, a system that's stretched, why are we not doing something that is beneficial? I think there's a business case. I think there's a human rights case for patient involvement in record sharing uh, facilitated by technology and aided by an appropriate culture of trust. I think in answer to your question, we are on the road of cultural change, but we still have many reluctant travellers. Thank you, Sheila. Um, I suppose you covered a, a, a lot of different aspects of it there, that it's not just a simple case of having the technology. It actually needs cultural change to really get the best out of it and also to um, ensure patients actually can get the best out of their healthcare for it. Um, so I think on, in the interest of time, um, we'll come to our final question for everybody. And that's really that with some of the examples that um, Vincent spoke about earlier, um, and there are some other ones such as the Epilepsy Lighthouse Project, and that there are some shining examples of uh, positive nuggets of EHR going on in Ireland, um, but they tend to be disease specific. Um, so the general question is, what really needs to be worked through uh, to get EHRs to the level in Ireland that uh, we really need them to be working so that we can get to the level where actual clinical research can happen, as well as improving healthcare? Sheila, if you want to start. Okay, I think internationally there's a pro been a professional reluctance. You know, I think in almost every country, the healthcare professionals have, you know, retreated to sort of protective protectionism, uh, a w an anxiety to protect, I would say an over anxiety to protect pa patients. I think even if that is valid in limited circumstances, it should not be the norm. It should not be the norm that uh, we are out there, uh, part of your job is actually not to protect the patient. Uh, well, it's to protect patients, but it's not to do so by denying them access to information. I think secondly, um, frequently, ex uh, you know, requests for information are, are s patients are seen as difficult or challenging, you know, that it's seen as a challenge to the system rather than somebody maybe like Jackie inquiring about something so that they can take it on to the next person who may not have received the information, you know. Um, I think another aspect of the challenges that we face is the area that uh, when patients request access for records, it's often seen as the first step in a legal action, a legal challenge. Um, I think that that sort of defense, it, it, it breeds a defensiveness on the part of healthcare professionals, and that pr defensiveness creates suspicion in patients that they haven't received uh, appropriate care. Um, I think that this whole era of defensiveness um, causes sort of, uh, you know, suspicion uh, and lack of trust. And I think it, we should have learned that what the Irish healthcare system really does need to do is build trust with our patients. So I think, you know, it, you know, it really is important that we we look at appropriate sharing of information and that we are less afraid about what patients, why patients are requesting it or what they might do to it, I think, th or how much protection they need. Thanks, Sheila. Okay, I'll put the question to Caroline. What do you think needs to be done yet? Um, 
Yeah, I think that's, I think because we live in a, a culture of litigation. I mean, I think I can see it there, and people are afraid to come. But I think the most important thing I would see is the building of relationship between patient and consultant first. I think that, you know, if there is the relationship there, well then, you know, it's not going to be seen as, oh, I'm trying to, <coughs> you know, catch you out on something, because it's not. I mean, anyone that's here, anyone that wants their, why do you want the records? It's because you're obviously going to look at them a lot more. You're there to try and help the person who's sick or yourself, or whatever else. So, you know, you're not starting off from a, oh, let's try, you know, you're saying, right, how can we make this better? Or in my case, for my son, you know, and I think it's about being in good relationship, but getting there and, you know, the pro project that, the Lighthouse Project, talking to patients, what do we want on the e-portal? Like, it's, what is there? It's to make life easier, as if for the patient, but also for the consultant, that they can see things and that, that it is a working together relationship and that that is the important thing that, you know, and that the question, and that's why it is so good to be involved from the beginning of, of this project of, you know, what as patients should be on it. It's not just about the medical, it's what we feel is important, like what affects my son on day to day in his medical condition. And, you know, I think that's so important and that's, you know, I definitely would commend the Lighthouse Project on that, that there is so much, you know, coming back to the patient. How is it working? How are you finding this? So I'm having problems with the IT. Well, let's we'll see how we can sort that. And, you know, I think going from there, but I mean, it has to be, you know, trust between them. It's not a matter of mm. catching somebody out. It's to make my son's care the best possible care I can get for him. And I'm quite sure that the consultant is for the same, but I'm going to spot something that, you know, could be overlooked. It won't be overlooked by me because mm. I, you know, I've only the one file and I will be, you know, scanning it. So if it's there on my e-portal, I will see it. And, you know, but that the right information, that we get the right information from the word go on the portals. Okay, thank you, Caroline. And Jackie, finally? Uh, just, uh, I think as well, I think we should be focusing as much, if not more, on the benefits of doing this right and of the benefits of involving patients from the outset, um, just as long as Caroline said, because we want to do to improve our own lives or our children's lives in the case of minors and things like that, or indeed for somebody who may be an older person whose capacity might be in question, somebody else, a significant person in their life might be wanting to. So this is about looking at the benefits of having an e-record so that we're improving the quality of life for people apart from the whole mitigating risk around safety patients and safety tasks and safety um, issues and things like that. Um, and the cost. There's no doubt in my mind that we will reduce costs. If we can reduce paper, it's good for the environment. There's so many benefits. I mean, you could sit here for the day and just start listing off benefits. And that's apart from the whole research thing and looking at research to discover. And I really like that point. And I think that's really important that we highlight that, the value of it. Um, and obviously, the very last thing I would say, obviously, speaking with my disability hat, we must remember to make sure it's accessible from get-go. That means signing, means accessible language, it means accessible um, computer software for people who are blind, visually impaired, uh, the whole gamut of access tools. But rather than retrofitting after the event, too late and more expensive. Thanks, Jackie. All right. So I, I guess there's a strong message there that like really this is a, a great opportunity in Ireland that we are at the start. And some might see that we're, we're starting a bit late compared to other countries. But we've got a great opportunity to actually start it correctly and to have the right voices there from the start and to build a really strong EHR system across our hospitals and with the right stakeholders involved. Um, okay, so on that, I will ask our two speakers from earlier to join us up on the panel and we can have a question and answer session. Okay, so anyone got burning questions that we can get started off with? We have some microphones, so please just wait for the mic to come to you. We've got one here now, please. Hello, thank you very much for the um, talks that you gave to us. My name is Marlee Swalsh, and I just find it intriguing and interesting to hear the language used that we are trying to build a good relationship, and we talk again about trust and confidence and culture, and I suppose 
I agree entirely with Sheila there that it's a multifaceted approach to fix a culture and it's a, it's a, it's a national large scale problem that will not just have one solution to the answer. But to actually hear patients say that they want to have a good relationship is like hearing someone saying that they need to breathe because I d have never met a patient who doesn't want the best outcome for themselves and who doesn't want a good relationship with the team that are trying to give them the best quality of life as is possible. So I just wanted to kind of make a comment on that, please, that it seems that's still being, that's still discussed, that's still in the ether somewhere. And it's important to acknowledge it, but I think it's very important that we move on from it fast okay. <laughs> for, yeah, for everybody's interest. Yeah, so but the good relationships uh, that really everyone wants to be on the yeah. same level. And well, it's, a, one? it's uh, a given, it's a collaboration, yeah, yeah that we're still missing. I think though that we we're you know that there are many hard working you know and incredibly competent clinicians uh, working in the system you know and administrative people working in the system you know I think to some extent the the not getting this right it, it is <coughs> not doing those people any services either you know uh, I mean I, agree. I, I would absolutely not want to, to to come across that that you know there isn't immense good work also being done in this it's just this area I is an area where we're, we're laggards and culturally we need a bit more a bit of a, a change in relation to involvement to patients and there are benefits both to clinicians and to patients in that sorry I, I agree completely I was agreeing with what you were saying and I just to quote um, Deepak there, it's uncovering opportunity really is the is the point rather than catching people out, I yeah. think, you know. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a, 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 an unusual term to yeah. use. Thank you. All right, and we've got another question over here. <laughs> Hi, um, Anne Lawley here from 22Q Ireland, and 22Q is um, a rare disease, so I kind of feel I speak for a lot of the rare disease population also. Um, Deepak, I thought that was fabulous, and I identify with Caroline, um, because I have a now adult child, 36, and complex care from the time she was born. So Deepak mentioned that as we age, we disease. But we have had these complex care conditions for a very long time. And I can't see why we haven't learned from them, first off. Um, and also with, with Caroline, I would give anything. I would give my right arm for electronic health records to my daughter. And I would have from the time she was born. We have a fabulous relationship with our clinicians now because we've developed um, a a clinic, a small clinic in Our Lady's Hospital in Crumlin. And we're now looking at a transition piece because of that relationship. And we want to co-produce the care pathway. We're doing it on our own, without, any, without much support. Um, I've discovered that the clinicians need support also. We support each other. Um, and there's so much to be had. I, I really, I can't emphasize it enough. I would give my right arm for an electronic health record for my daughter. Our children get to 18, they also have a learning difficulty, so this makes it extra difficult for them to have that information so that my daughter doesn't have to go in when I'm, her greatest worry now is who's going to look after her when I'm gone. <coughs> so she doesn't have to worry about repeating information that she can't even hold in her head. And to have those relationships really, really important. And electronic health records are such uh, an important component of that care. Thanks, Anne. Does anyone want to comment on that? We move on to another question. Okay, deep back. Thanks. Um, <coughs> I'm delighted with what you had to say, but I'd like to even just say before that that I was really moved by these three uh, fireside uh, contributions. So just thanks to all three of you. Um, I've long argued actually across Europe that the rare disease communities, that is the families, the, the, the children or adults, and the care teams are a trailblazer. They are the role model for how the whole of healthcare needs to be. And we all have a lot to learn from them. 
Uh, that includes the willingness to share data, the willingness to connect with other patients with the same condition, swap notes, have a lot of transparency, because in the end, the best healthcare is the most important thing. Uh, I also think that there's a spirit of learning across the care teams at a European level. They're willing to learn from each other and eat humble pie, which I think is really healthy. But I think I'd like to make another point, if I could, which is that the days of the patronizing model of healthcare delivery are over. I've heard from these three firesiders, if I could call you that, um, very compelling reasons why the patient and or their family has to be on the inside of the care delivery team. They have to be fully informed and supported with the digital tools to themselves be smart decision makers, self-managers, and to have a cooperative partnership relationship with healthcare. And the future of our digital solutions has to be designed from the beginning to implement that model, not the old-fashioned model, because otherwise we'll have legacy systems the moment we unveil the ribbon, you know? That's the model we have to build in for the future. I suppose that speaks very nicely to what Sheila was saying earlier, that it's not just the technology that we need, it's also this culture change to really bring all the partners together. Okay, we've got another question over here. Hello. I come at this from a patient and a patient advocacy point of view. Uh, with a cancer for the last uh, 18 years, um, and still, uh, the cancer is still active. But I just wonder what the panel might uh, think in terms of uh, uh, my view, which is that the, uh, the tectonic plates are in fact moving. The patronizing approach won't wash anymore. But I think that the, uh, the opportunities that exist for the patient to interact meaningfully uh, with their clinicians and with their families and so on can be augmented by uh, a proper uh, use of, uh, of technology uh, and that they, they can contribute to their future uh, health and well-being by trying to insist with their clinicians that the quality of life may, depending on their particular circumstances, may be actually more important than progression-free survival or overall survival, and that quality of life is a very personal and particular thing. And I think if the records, if the electronic records are available and accessible to the patient, they would like to use them and they would like to get a, uh, a response from the clinicians and the administrators that allow for that interaction. Do you have any I thoughts on that? Hi. Um, as part of the e-portal, that we have part of it is a questionnaire that is sent out at regular intervals, um, looking at quality of life qu questions, and they go they're fed back to one of the nurses who is obviously working on this. So you know, these these are happening, and you know how life is, and from month to month it changes. However, and I think many quality of life questionnaires and surveys are mediated by the clinicians. Mm -hmm. There are very few patient-mediated quality of life uh, surveys of any quality. There. So even going back there. to what questions are being asked. I'm, I'm afraid to have that a joint, you know, yeah. uh, a joint. the clinicians yeah. are biased. Uh, not that they're intentionally malicious, but that by, n by the nature of their, uh, their, mm. their practice yeah. and their, their training, they are I think, in yeah. Regards yeah. To I, I think, think sorry, that sorry, Sheila. I think the very fact, though, that it's there on the epilepsy e portal is acknowledging something. Do you know what I mean? That yeah. that there is okay. How it's written mightn't be perfect yet, but it's there, and I think that's so important. That yes, we do recognise with a long term illness that there is a question of, you know, quality of life, and that it is part of the overall care, which is very much on the e portal, the epilepsy e portal. Uh, okay. And I think the only other thing I would like to add to that is the fact that the idea of autonomy and self-determination also allows 
for patients to not engage if they so wish, that not everybody may want to be active, uh, uh, you know, in terms. So I think, you know, just to the assumption that everybody is going to be vigilantly at home looking at their electronic records, I think is, is pushing it, <laughs> <laughs> even as an advocate. Like. And, and I'll just add into that as well. I couldn't agree more with you, because, I mean, that's the core f of, for me, the clinician's view of what might be better quality of life for me might be different to my view of what might be. So is it treatment A, treatment B? He, he or she might prefer treatment A, but I actually might prefer treatment B for whatever reasons, back to my decision about my quality of life. I couldn't agree more with you. And absolutely, I've, the lady that raised the issue about relationships Personally, I'm so lucky. I have wonderful relationships with all, all I meet, um, and it's great. And I've, thankfully, that's why I'm as well as I am, because I have very good relationships. And like they say to me, they're learning more from me, and, and they recognise the burden that I have put on myself by bringing around my record. And they're so grateful. I make their lives easy. Hmm. A quick one from Vincent, and then we'll move on to... Okay, so I, I think that there's a, a whole range of um, programs underway that patient reported outcome measures, some of which do genuinely touch in certain conditions on things that are highly valued by uh, patients. And I think that there's something to be learned from those. I think one of the systematic um, changes that's underway with the health system is the patient experience survey. And that I think has been really informative and actually driving quite a lot of the changes that we're all here aspiring to. And, and it's been very, very interesting to see how that is actually informing the way organizations right down to the ward level are beginning to um, adopt, where, where they don't have it already, beginning to adopt something that really resonates with the individual patients. It's out of my um, kind of scope. I, I'm, I'm just a technologist, I'm not a clinician. And I, I, um, I suppose I should just acknowledge that bit, but I think for systematically the patient experience survey is really helpful to make sure that that experience is well understood at the point of care delivery. And I think that that's been a really welcome um, change within the system. Okay. Thanks, Vincent. Okay, you've got more question over here. Um, I'm a, a neurologist, but I'm, I'm a couple of, I completely agree with the comments actually around uh, patient autonomy and, and uh, also the, the concept of clinical meaningfulness is something meaningful for the person. It might be meaningful from an outcome measure for us. It might have a p-value, but it may not be meaningful for the person. But I've actually a question uh, for, for Vincent and actually for the panel in general because well, I was really struck by a couple of things. One was the idea that the direct relationship that each of the panel members have with their specialists. Um, but actually, in the Irish health system, technically, the, the point of, of care um, and the collective the collection of information is with the general practitioner. And so, so the repository, the way our health system is currently designed, the repository of all of the data, be it in paper format, is, 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 te is technically supposed to be with the GP. And actually, Sloan to Care is designed to have the, the um, care at the, the highest quality care at the lowest level of complexity. Um, and all of the conversation that we've had this morning is, is around the concept of e e elect electronic health records in the concert context of secondary and tertiary care. Whereas, in fact, if we were going to do a healthcare system properly, um, the, the, the repository of information should definitely be digital, absolutely, but it should be accessible at primary care level. And we haven't really touched on that at all. Of course, there are huge challenges in Ireland because o o only a, a proportion of our primary care is publicly mediated and a, a high percentage of it is private. And it's a kind of a curvy ball question for Vincent as to you know, how do we address that? We should obviously the first point is unique patient identifiers. There are lots of issues around data protection there, of course, as well. But if we want to really make this work properly, we're going to have to, to really gra um, grasp or recognize and acknowledge the massive problems that we have because it's not appropriate really that we should um, continuously de deliver care that could be de delivered at the lowest level of complexity at the highest and most expensive level of complexity. And the data that Deepak showed really was, was actually the Kaiser Healthcare, which is a HMO, the Health Maintenance Organization. So, so loads of those data are coming from a primary care type environment. So we really, if we're going to do this properly and we're going to have data that really provides meaningful results, we're going to have to join up the dots with respect to primary, secondary, and tertiary care. And the EPR is going to have to be accessible to not just those of us who use it, who are users, but also 
the delivery of care in the primary care sector, and we haven't addressed that at all this morning. Thank you. So, so uh, thank you for the curveball. Um, I'm, uh, <laughs> I see a lot of them coming to me. Uh, I, I occasionally manage to catch one. Um, so I, I think I think you're correct. I mean, I think the Slauncher Care program is about that reorientation of care and that refocus of care. I think that we um, we have a long way to go to see the levels of investment out in primary care that would be appropriate for the needs of the population. And we've got um, a, a health system that is underpinned by legislation that goes back many, many decades. Okay, so we are, we are um, moving on an, a series of fronts. And, and again, I, 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 my, my role is somewhat narrow in this space, okay? Um, but we are trying to make sure that the legislation is lined up that allows us to do some of the enabling works. We've got that with the individual health identifier. It's now around implementation challenges around that. I think that, um, and, and I appreciate that it was um, not possible to see the detail of that slide I showed around the, um, um, the shared record, but some of the learning um, um, projects that we have underway are specifically to place in the hands of general practice better quality data and more comprehensive data so that they can attend to the individual that presents in the practice. And we've got, we've got two things. One of the things is the, the record that the GP has is often a really good record, okay, that they have anyway. A, um, providing additional information to the GP through that shared record is going to be additionally helpful about moving <coughs> care out. If I just briefly touch on, on, on NIMIS, for example, there's a cohort of community physios that are now able to look up um, results which help them deliver the right care, as you say, in the lowest level of acuity. So there's lots of work underway moving on these fronts um, which will um, come together and lead to much better care. Some of it is really that fundamental enabling work, such as the joining the dots through the health identifiers. Um, other parts are about moving along this, this culture change that's necessary. Um, uh, um, when I started in the health system 16 years ago, there was a grave reluctance for internally ordered laboratory results within a hospital to be shared with a GP. That is no longer the case. Okay, so the cultural shift is happening, and it's it's happening. Culture shift doesn't change as fast as we would like. We we, we appreciate that, but I do think there's many things happening that will all move us in a very positive direction towards. As I said um, when I spoke, the experts. Um, are really the people that live with the conditions and it's the specialists that help them live with them. And I think that we're seeing much work. Many of the, the, the way we, we direct projects involves um, the clinical, the um, um, executive and the ICT teams working together. In the last couple of years, I've seen many of those project boards also include patient representatives and it's a very enriching experience mm -hmm and it really helps them make decisions in the light of what's important for patients and seeing that more and more, and that's a, it's a very welcome development because that actually is a big structural change that will help us hit the target more often. Okay, and I think Deepak wanted to come in there and then Could we'll I? be finishing up very shortly. Then. Just speaking as somebody who was once a GP a long time ago, we, we need to remember that the general practitioner is the broad, holistic player in the field compared to the specialists who do the deep dives. So throwing a large amount of data at the GP is not necessarily helpful unless you combine that with smart tools. And we've spoken a lot today about information. We haven't spoken about tools. But if in fact we partner high volumes of electronic health record data, which would overwhelm most people with smart tools that filter that profile, that give dashboards, charts, trends, then we don't have an information overload. And we just need to be mindful about the role of the different actors. And if those dashboards and trends are really nice, why is the patient not also a recipient of that? So we start to then say there may be a common information heritage that is as complete as possible, but we recognize that people will have different needs. And if I was the GP of you and your family, you would know a lot more about epilepsy than me. 
So probably I would be looking at a more superficial view of the epilepsy care, and I'd ask you to tell me, when do I double click and look at a bit of detail? Because you tell me when I need to know a bit more as your GP. I wouldn't know. You know, that's just, that's the partnership model, isn't it? All right, thank you very much. I think um, we're just out of time for questions. Um, was there one burning one from the, okay, we haven't heard from that side of the room at all. But we'll have a very quick one and then we'll wrap up. Uh, um, um, question for Vincent, actually. Um, um, Vincent, um, I'm just thinking of the software side of things. Um, the, I think the best idea, and, and it, it, it could be, um, I, don't, it, I don't know if it's possible, is to link all the electronic health records. The ideal scenario would be to link all the general hospitals in the country, all the private hospitals in the country, and all the primary health care, um, uh, the GPs, all, all the primary health care teams, and that it's one, some, one software, type of software, and they all link into each other. So I have a daughter also who has a rare disease and she's just hit 16, so we're hitting transition as well. But um, just if she got sick in Dublin and I'm, in, I'm at home in Galway, um, that they have all the records, you know, in Dublin with a click at a click, the same as Galway, they have all the records. Crumlin have them, but Galway have them as well, that everybody's working off the same hymn sheet. And, and, you know, she has done some a bit of research. She's done, because they knew her history, she's been done some of the exams for the, med the medical students because she's a rare disease and whatever. But only that they knew, you know, she could help people in the future with her condition because it's a rare, rare disease. But I think the software, everybody having the same software and you can get easy access to, um, to a patient's uh, electronic health records. That would be my hope in the future. Uh, and and um, I, I think that's the aspirations we all have. I think that the, the challenge that we've got is um, trying to do that in a way that really delivers value to the individual patients and the people that provide the care there. And um, the, the um, trying to do it fast enough across as many um, conditions that we can and, and specialties that we can. I think that the, the focus that we have initially around the investment around the children's hospital, we then also need to look at the whole pediatric model of care. And I, I, I don't want to just throw another term in here, <laughs> but the intention is that you don't have to show up at the children's hospital to get excellent pediatric care. And part of that is about ensuring that everybody in that care process has the information and the detail. And I think that we are on a journey and we need to um, do what we can to accelerate that journey. And we need to involve all of the stakeholders along the way. And, and so I think that your aspiration will probably be too late for your daughter uh, in the pediatric care cycle. But it is certainly something that very many people are fully committed to achieving. Yeah, and, and I think, I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's welcome to have that reiterated. And, and I know many of the people I work with are, are working towards that as well. Okay, so on that point, I think we're going to wrap up for lunch. Um, but I just want to, I suppose, thank everyone that spoke today from our two initial speakers and our three firesiders, as their new name is. <laughs> I think we'll adopt that. Uh, but I guess even through all of the talks and uh, the chat that we had, there were real themes there about uh, connectivity between different areas of the healthcare system that it's not just acutes but it goes right through to the community into primary and to really have a joined up picture um, but also that it's not just about the technology or the software that it's also about this cultural change about patients if they want to be involved to really um, give them the access to their healthcare and that they can be on this uh, shared journey and I don't really like the, <laughs> the phrase of a healthcare journey but really that it is a journey that um, the patients have a part in it to play as well as the clinicians and to strengthen that relationship and hopefully for me anyway my hope would be that these e EHRs are part of strengthening that relationship and improving healthcare for patients. Thank you very much everyone.
Okay, could I ask everybody to just come back into the room and we'll begin the next session. And thanks everybody for contributing to the, uh, the morning session. Uh, I found it wonderfully invigorating and reassuring to know that not only are our patient advocates well able to speak their mind and their voice, but uh, not only do they speak very loudly, but they hit, hit the nail on so many heads. Um, so I think you're making Danielle's job an awful lot easier from a rapporteur. Uh, perspective, some very, very clear messages coming through, and I hope we will we'll even follow up with some of the questions uh, at the later Q&A and, and during the panel. Uh, just to encourage people as well, feel free to come over to uh, our graphic artists over here. Uh, we're, we're working on capturing these in a way to share, primarily for those people who are not in the room uh, and those who are were following uh, and on the live stream. But just to say that all of the presentations will be packaged and, and put together quite quickly and made available uh, on our website. We want to keep the conversation going that we've started here today, um, and we want to continue that on into the next session. So uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our chairperson. Uh, that's uh, Ava Battles from uh, the MS Society. She's the CEO of the MS Society, but she's also, more importantly, the chair of iPOSI. So Ava, if you'd like to come up to chair this session. Hello everyone, thank you so much for coming back from lunch. So this morning we had fireside chats with our patient representatives and this afternoon we're going to have a, what's called lightning presentation session. So we have really put it up to our four presenters um, for the afternoon. We've given them five to six minutes to present on their topic, which as you can imagine is quite, quite a difficult task. But what it will allow then is an opportunity for us to have questions and answers afterwards. So just to set the scene, so each one will present for five to six minutes um, and then we'll have questions and answers. So please um, make sure that you're gathering your questions and answers for that session. We'll try and make it as interactive as possible. So I'm not going to give you detailed introductions to each of our presenters. There are four. Um, and as you can see from your conference brochure, there is actually a lot of detail about how wonderful each of our four presenters are. So there's no fear, there's no fear of that. I will just introduce them with uh, two lines each. And as I say, keep it strictly to five to six minutes and we'll work from there. So our first presenter is Declan Noon. Declan is one of the patient reps on the National Procurement Committee for Haemophilia Products. And hot off the press, he is, as of yesterday, president of the European Haemophilia Consortium. And Declan is going to talk to us today about the positive example of haemophilia and how everything we talked about this morning in relation to, you know, what needs to be done is being done in the haemophilia space. Thanks, Eva. Um, I'm probably going to speak very, very quickly because it is five to seven minutes. That might also be because I'm really tired and over-caffeinated. So if I lose you, I'm really, really sorry. I will try and speak slowly. Okay, so I like to call it a dynamic... Uh, you see, or problems already. Um, a dynamic electronic health record. And the reason that I like to call it dynamic is because there's plenty of what I call static. You enter information in and it does nothing. So I only believe in dynamic, um, and that's the one that I'm, I'm going to really, really uh, push because that's the one that drives change, that's the one that is beneficial to patients, and that's the one for, that for me is important. So in hemophilia, we were originally starting out with, we had one national centre, and then we had comprehensive, or we, we had two comprehensive care centres, uh, one was uh, children's, one was in Cork, and then we had a number of hemophilia treatment centres. They were, sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, so we, had, we have those key centres that patients go to. Now, there's a number of other hospitals, and I will get to that, but at the moment, this is where we started off. And we had an electronic health record that went between the two hospitals, as with most health records at the time. It just went through the, two, the couple of hospitals, didn't link into anything else, and you have no information in any of the other hospitals, as you, as you pointed out, which is, which is a major issue. And the really little arrows are... Uh, information, which are either data in terms of um, Excel spreadsheets going back and forth or databases, but I switched it away from data to information because we had to change the piece when I get to the patient care piece. So we built on that and that electronic healthcare system. Now 
um, allows us to purchase medications. It all comes into one location, and that goes into the uh, into a van, and that goes to the hospitals, and it goes to the patient's home. So again, no real information coming in from the patient at this point. Um, we're using the electronic health record to put information into the stockist, which is great and useful. Um, we measure it going into the van, and we measure basically, basically where it is. And I mean, I do mean basically, as in these are the batches. There's 2,000 batches in this hospital in Cork. That's all we have. That's all we know at this point. And we took the opportunity over the over the coming over the years and, and, and some of the savings that we've made um, to introduce a electronic <laughs> patient record. We did that using, a, using the health record itself first. So we looked and we monitored all of the volumes that were going in. We broke out all of the volumes for the different hemophilia A, hemophilia B, von Willebrands. We defined, this, we, we defined key tenders and where the treatment was supposed to go. So now we have the electronic health record going to uh, going the information going to the product selection committee, which has patients involved. It is then been used to drive the tender, so which the patients are involved in choosing the products. It then goes into the indep uh, independent delivery company, and then that's shipped. And we have information going back and forth between um, each one of these sections. But at this point, we still don't have any information being collected from the patients themselves. So in one of the tenders, we met a saving, and we used that saving to develop uh, a, a patient app. And the patient app was not just to collect information from the patient, but to run the entire system appropriately and correctly and monitor everything. So what happened in terms of GD, well, what GDPR wasn't around at the time, we had information that the patient scanned their treatment on use, and it went to the hospital. But the patient doesn't really care. And I am one of the patients. I don't care about, um, I think I'm with somebody uh, earlier on, I don't care about how many uh, events I've had in the last two or three months. It is important to me, it is exceptionally important to me, and it's important to my treatment. But I don't, on a day-to-day -day basis, it doesn't bother me. However, by introducing this, my conversation with my clinician changed. Because what I was doing was, I was writing down on a piece of paper in the car park, going into the hospital going, I hope you don't get caught, I hope you didn't see it, and you just space them out because you just get tired of doing the same thing over and over again. So all of it was scanned, it was all gone into the clinician, and the conversation changed from, um, how many bleeds have you had in the last couple of months? I was like, well, uh, three? And he was like, oh, okay. It changed to two, how many bleeds have you had in the last couple of months? I was like, I've had three. And he went, no, you've had eight. They've all been on your right-hand side, so I'm changing your, your prescription to every second day rather than three times a week. And all of those bleeds have been on the right side, predominantly your right ankle. So we're using the physiotherapist to build up the strength in that right ankle and prescribed a couple of them. So we're like, okay, now I'm actually creating information that is useful to help me get on with my daily life, finally, super. But that's not enough because you still want to drive some more. We used that, we used that information um, within the, the hospital system as well. So what we wanted to do was create a situation for patients to be able to go to any individual hospital in Ireland in the case of an emergency and be treated. They don't have to have their data records there. We've given everybody a, 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 a severe bleeding disorder alert card. So they show that information. If we were to try and link every hospital, it would take, we would still be here 15 years later. So at the time, to save time and to improve treatment, we set up so that the hospital used the app. So they scanned it in and out the same way the patient does and sends it over. Uh, the hospital rings the main centers and, and they work with the health record that they have. And the information just goes, goes round and round. Now, one of the things that we introduced at this point, which I, I think is exceptionally useful, is a, an, a warning system. So the warning system set, okay, yep. So the warning system basically suggests um, in a certain event, so if you have a, a bleed in your head, then you get an instant 24-hour 24 24 call to the, to the patient. Through all of this, we have in, we've purchased the most safest and most efficacious products. We have access to everything that we require in the country. We are the highest user of factor concentrates in the 
in Europe, but probably in the world. And we're the first country to improve access to treatment and increase troughs. And all of this, all of it, was done by increasing the treatment and reducing the cost. We had the same cost in 2002 in Belgium, or we had the same system in 2002 in Belgium. They didn't change their system, and on the right-hand side in the yellow is the costs that went up in Belgium, and in the blue on the right-hand side is the costs in Ireland. It came down over time because we knew what we were doing, and we were aiming to improve the patient's experience, treatment, and the health system. Thank you very much. Thanks, Declan. As you can see, really difficult, but you managed to you managed to pull that around. Thank you. A really positive example. So what we'll do is we will build on that, hopefully. Now, our next presentation is from Mary Fitzsimons from the Epilepsy Lighthouse Project. Mary is going to talk to us about epilepsy health experience. She's leading on this project now for the last 15 years, and uh, she's going to take us through how they're moving into the patient portal. Thank you very much, everybody, and thanks very much, Iposey, for inviting me here today. Um, so I'm going to see if I can stick to this challenge. Um, so I wanted to tell you a little bit about our history with the epilepsy um, e-health environment and our electronic patient record and where it's leading us today and where it touches on some of the points talked about earlier on. The purpose of this slide is just to tell you that this, the whole business of electronic patient records or electronic health records isn't a destination, it's a journey. And we've been on this journey, the epilepsy community, since about 2004, and with a lot of different milestones along the way. There's a little teenager over on this side, but the good news is that that teenager is now very optimistic, looking at potential for new ideas that he or she can do with this electronic health record that I'm going to just try and tell you about. So um, when we started on this journey, some of the drivers that we've heard of this morning about the ability to have simultaneous access to a shared care record, engaging patients as partners in their own care, having access to data that you can interrogate for a number of different purposes was the original reason we went on this journey. The system is now used across Ireland in a number of different epilepsy centres with about 9,000 individual health records and those bubbles are just different use contexts that the, e the epilepsy electronic patient record is used in. But what I want to get to is where we are today, having done 15 years of this journey. We're now looking at how the electronic patient record, and this applies across the board, it isn't peculiar to epilepsy, can actually support a range of activities around patient care that span from the laboratory to the living room. And what I mean by that is we're looking at how our electronic patient record for epilepsy is supporting genomic medicine. And genomic medicine is often talked about as being precision care, finding the underlying cause of the condition rather than treating the symptoms. We're looking at the use of the, the, the um, electronic patient record to give people access to their own, re own health care record, allow them to become authors of their own health care record so that, that they can be more proactive in their care, and looking at data so that we can find out from our population of data things about disease progression, treatment um, response rates and all that, and how knowing that can feed, feed into other individuals' care. This is a national project going because we're able to have the electronic patient record across the, the country. Um, so from the genomics point of view, what this is allowing us to do is genomic medicine relies on really having a clear clinical picture of the individual to link what's going on in their genetics with what's going on clinically. Without that, the genetics is useless. So our electronic patient record is giving us that data. We're able to uh, understand, interpret the genetics in the context of the clinical picture. So, sorry, I've gone backwards. So the other thing we're doing is we've built a patient portal into the electronic patient record, the epilepsy electronic patient record, which gives the patients a range of functionality. Caroline mentioned it earlier on this morning, gives people access to their patient summary about their um, epilepsy care, gives them access to questionnaires about their quality of life, their knowledge of their epilepsy, setting goals about their epilepsy care, preparing for appointments, and access to clinic letters. I won't go into the detail of that, except to say, here's some of the things people are saying about this portal. It gave me added com confidence that something is being done about my particular case and was useful to have my records so easily accessible. I had forgotten I had certain procedures um, or taken specific anti-epilepsy medications. 
I really va value this. I am a control freak. I like to have as much information as possible. Now, lest you think I think it's all positive, of course some people come back to us and they say, oh my goodness, I saw the word abnormal in my record. I was a bit alarmed about that. But you know what they do then is sometimes they go and they find out what does this, you know, for example, the word comorbidities, what does that mean? So we feel that giving people access to their information is helping with health literacy, improving health literacy. I won't go on to that just in the interest of time. Clinicians are saying, you know, oh, well, we use the word anti-epilepsy drugs, but patients mightn't. But we want to get to a point where we're able to talk the same language to each other. We shouldn't be them and us. And as somebody already said here this morning, is if you, if you haven't been a patient to date, someday you're going to be. We're all patients. So we want to be able to share the same language. In terms of the analytics part of the project, um, because we now have 9,000 longitudinal records in our, healthcare, in our epilepsy electronic patient record, we're able to do some interrogation that give us, gives us added insights about what's going on for our population of people with epilepsy. It allows us to draw different conclusions, allows um, us to make different decisions, and to monitor performance of our healthcare um, system. And I won't go into that, but just some examples. One of our NCHDs has recently done a study on looking at the etiology spread across three and a half thousand people who have records in the electronic patient record. And they're able to see at a broad level kind of what the etiology and then dig down further into that. And this is important in terms of understanding the type of treatments that we need to engage with. So I'm just going to get to the end of this and just to say that the theme, as I understand it for today, was how do we get electronic health records right from the start? And I'm not here saying that the epilepsy ecosystem has done that, but what I do want to let you know is it's actually very little about technology and really all about people. And it's really about how getting people together, and I mean people on every side of the equation. It's not just the clinicians, it's not the healthcare providers, it's patients, their families, technologists, policy makers, and that all those people together have a commitment to making things better. And that these people are domain experts in their own way, and they bring all of that divergent thinking together to say, how do we use the technology to make it better? What kind of technology do we need? We don't want to, as some, somebody said, pave the cow path. We want to do something really different. It takes courage, it takes energy, and it takes a long time. As I say, I've been at this for 15 years. I'm 21, I know I look a lot older, but there you go. I think one of the important things, though, also to say is that there is the concept of technology ethics. We, you know, people talk about GDPR and data protection. Data protection is not new. But the whole business of how do we do this ethically? How do we create technology that is for everybody and um, makes things better for everybody? So I just want to acknowledge all these different people um, who've been involved in this, Epilepsy Ireland, people with epilepsy and their families, and a range of other people who've been involved in our journey to date. And um, I just want to leave you with this thought. I, we were talking after the last session earlier on to say, well, what would make this different? I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I think the power is in the customer. Like in other industries, we talk about the customer is always right. What does the customer want, and how do we deliver that? And actually think about who the customer is. Sometimes it, the customer is the patient. Sometimes the customer is a, pa a, a care partner of the patient. Sometimes it's another clinician who's looking for something because they've been referred by another clinician. C customers are all sorts of people in this regard, but they're always right. Let's listen to what they're talking about and you know, make a movement to get this done. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. Our third presentation is Shane McGee from Belfast HSE Trust. He's a consultant in genetics, interested in genomics and electronic health records and how we can use data to improve diagnostics and management. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Um, I'm hoping to give a little bit of a description today about what is going on up north of the border. Um, I don't know whether that's in preparation for any uh, shenanigans that are likely to happen in the very near future, but uh, you never know. So we might have to plug into your ecosystem a little bit quicker than, uh, than we've been planning to so far. What we're doing in the north at the minute is we're trying to build um, an information ecosystem to pull together information and data that's coming from multiple different sources. Um, my presentation is not largely focused towards the patient side of things at the moment, but I hope you'll be able to see that there are areas in here where we are trying to specifically engineer this in such a way that we can then bring our patients on in, and uh, I'll welcome any sort of comment that might go on with that. But like 
many health ecosystems pretty much everywhere. We're dealing with a fragmented ecosystem that's been developed over the years by um, funding that's been coming from multiple different sources. It's not strategically directed uh, towards uh, doing things. And in fact, our health system is based on five acute hospital trusts that have nine patient administration systems that are still running as separate instances at the same time. And that presents a data interoperability nightmare, as you might imagine, even within the one hospital trust. And then lots and lots and lots, hundreds of little isolated systems. These would include um, patient-facing systems, such as our quite successful, but nonetheless very low-tech renal patient EMED system, which allows our renal uh, patients to get access to all their data, or much of their data. Um, and it's very healthcare professional-centered. It's all about the doctors. In fact, it's not even about the nurses even very much. It's nearly all about the doctors. And this needs to change, and this needs to be needs to be set up uh, in a proper way. And of course, 99% of it nearly runs on paper, and paper is still a, con a very core part of all that happens with it, and that's why a lot of things go wrong. So what we have had over the last uh, six years or so is an electronic care record, which has been a very successful IT implementation thing. It's one of those rare beasts that's a successful healthcare-based IT rollout um, that joins all our appointments, letters, um, our lab results, our x-ray results, and lots and lots of stuff together across all the trusts. But it's great if you're in the hospital. If you're a patient, not so great. So we're working on a process at the moment for our dementia patients and their carers to roll out a portal into that data to give them access to this. And it's, it's been a fantastic success so far. So where we're moving that towards now is a new thing called Encompass, which is an electronic health record that will do away with all those different patient administration systems and map out the, the healthcare process as one single unit. Those of you who have done work with electronic health records will have heard the name of the company Epic, and they're the ones we're going with, and that presents a lot of challenges because that's a big American corporation, and big American corporations, in fact, any corporation, you're dealing with closed data systems, and how do we get that information out and make sure that that then is something that we can choose to deploy out to other clinicians and to our patients and to other uh, areas of the healthcare system. And um, this mess, is what I want our healthcare ecosystem to look like, to bring all the different groups together, but to kind of collect um, everyone together in this spider web of, of informatics, that the data is flowing around so that it can actually start to do what we, what we needed to do. So how does that then apply to my day job of genomics and genetics? Well, genetics and genomics obviously has the rare disease aspect to it, and our patients obviously, like, as you know, and many of you in this room will know, it's like, crawling through a desert looking for that oasis that's going to tell you or give you a diagnosis. But then even what happens to the other side of your diagnosis? Where's the, where's the benefit out of that? We want to bring information that we're getting from the UK 100,000 Genomes Project, so whole genome sequencing data, to actually be a benefit to patients. But you need, there's one key thing, key thing that people don't get. You need very clear, detailed phenotyping. And I know that's been mentioned a few times before and was mentioned before I um, even arrived here, so I'm sorry I missed the talks on that. But you need to know what's actually the matter with your patient before you can say what you think the cause of the thing is, because interpreting genomes is no easy thing. So what we're trying to do is build this system that at the bottom here, I've called it GenOceanic, the Genomics Open Core Engine for Accelerating Northern Ireland Care. It's called that because uh, back in the olden days, you'll remember a company called Harland & Wolf who used to build ocean liners. And the largest ocean liner in 1899 was the Oceanic. And uh, it, it, it didn't sink, at least not them. Um, so um, I thought this would be a good, uh, a good thing to call it. And I couldn't come up with a good uh, acronym that would have Titanic on it, and I thought it would have too many other um, annotations. The purpose of this is to be a regional system across the two million people who live in Northern Ireland, and then also to tie into other health ecosystems elsewhere. And obviously, I'm here today, you guys are here today, I'm looking south of the border as well to make sure that we can keep that all going, even whatever Boris decides he's going to do with, uh, with the stuff. It's based on open standards, and I know Deepak has been talking about that before. We need to know on our side what we're talking about and what is going on in your side. So we want to pull that together, like I'm trying to suck data in from any different source and present that in a way that it makes it u meaningful, useful, and certainly beneficial to our patient population. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shane. Thanks a million. That was spot on. Our final presentation is from Loretto. Uh, Loretto Gogan is going to talk 
to us about uh, why what we need why we need to get it right. And Loretto is um, an, in the nursing and midwifery space. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. It's lovely to be here. Um, as a, my name is Radha Grogan. I'm the National Clinical Information Officer for Nursing and Midwifery in, in the HSC. So I'm just going to talk the next three slides are a little bit in terms of setting context of why we need to get this right. Um, the first slide is a slide that I integrate into most of my talks. And it's a really simple slide, and it just talks about people and patients. So we're all people. We'll all be patients. So they're at the core of what we do every day and why we do it. Again, I, I talk about most of us live at home. We live in the community. And we use other services when we become too unwell to be at home or need a specific intervention. So we're one person. We're journeying through acute and community care. So I really try to highlight to colleagues, particularly when we're thinking about our data moving forward, standardization, that we need to think above the acute setting or the community setting. We need to focus on the patient and how we're going to manage that data going forward. And health and well-being, it's a key building block for, for society. Being able to enjoy good health and well-being is a right of every citizen in the country. The next slide, I know we've all seen this many, many times, is our Sloan Care, our national policy. You can see Strategic Action 10 is our e-health infrastructure and getting that right to connect our health services and also to digitally connect our citizens to our health service. And this is key going forward. And that whole getting our EHRs right, getting our data right, is a key part of getting our Sloan Care um, strategy right. If we don't enable for integration, if we don't think of that bigger picture, that patient-focused data, it'll be a real challenge to get that right. And the next piece is our healthcare data. It's a challenge. Even from a nursing and midwifery perspective, in terms of location, we have data everywhere. It's in, it's in filing cabinets, it's on desktops, some of it's in EHRs, and some of it's in, diff in different digital format. Our data format, some of the data is structured, unstructured, some of it's in PDF, JPEGs, um, regulations and requirements. We all know about GDPR and regulations, and this can be, a, it's a challenge and an opportunity at the same time. Data complexity. We're trying to get data from humans into a kind of data or warehousing or a, a, a tech environment. Our data definitions are a challenge. Um, and that's something I know that, that, that we're, we're starting to address. And we can have a challenge like a broken hip could be a fractured hip or it could be a hip fracture. So then when we go to look at that from a national perspective, how do we analyze that? And then our data structures. We have data that some of it is very structured, some of it is unstructured, and it's actually managing all that. So from a nursing and midwifery perspective, what we will do. The office of the CIO have um, a five-year strategic um, goals. There's eight goals. Um, so what we have done in nursing and midwifery is we have developed a roadmap for digital nursing and midwifery and aligned those goals to the office of the CIO's goals. So the first, our first goal is empower citizen-centric healthcare. So what we will do as nurses and midwives, and again, this is just hot off the press. This was only, I only presented that to our corporate colleagues last week. Um, so we want to initiate a national conversation with people who use our services and their families to understand how they use and how they want to use technology to support and manage their health and well-being. We want to develop systems of engagement to incorporate the people who use our services input into an ongoing experience of digital services. And this has all been cognizant that, that we haven't always been good at doing this. We want to identify new and emerging technologies shaping the future of healthcare delivery for our patients and our service users. We want to utilize digital solutions and products to enable improved and more efficient person-centered care. We want to advocate in partnership with people who use our services to find the most appropriate digital solutions. We want to establish methods and systems to manage patient-generated data. I get so much feedback from colleagues that patients are now coming into clinics, say from my colleagues who are specialists and advanced practitioners. They're actually managing their own information digitally. Or else they have an app, it may be regulated, it may be an unregulated app that they're using to get information from or to add information to. So they're presenting at clinics and they have all their own information digitally somewhere. So again, that is, it's, it's our challenge to actually work with patients and 
put a plan in place for how we're going to manage all that. Now, we don't have, like I said, this is just hot off the press. So in the next number of months, we would really appreciate a conversation with how we're going to initiate that national conversations. And that will be done in conjunction with our other clinical colleagues and our technical colleagues. And so this is a core piece of what we hope to do. That's only goal. There are eight other goals that I don't have time to go, to go into. But hopefully that will be published in the wider arena in the next month or so. Again, what right will look like, and I know everyone has spoken and touched on this this morning, information follows the patient. This is key. We have case scenarios, particularly some with multi-comorbidities, where they have several providers, and it's actually having that information and having access to that information for things like me medication, reconciliation, um, adverse events, etc. The comprehensive picture of health for the patient and their families, and again, say for end-of-life care and other case scenarios, this is actually so important. Empowering patients to manage their own health, facilitating self-management, shared decision-making. I know a lot of my colleagues really want to, to, to actually have that platform where there is shared decision-making and where they have information to enable that shared decision-making, because currently that is a challenge. Information is not in one place. And a partnership approach to delivering healthcare, and particularly in terms of Sloan Care, that really is important that we all work as partners. We'll have more in engaged and informed patients and citizens. The right data in the right, for the right patient in the right place at the right time. Um, and I'm going to move on because I've just been shown the, the red card. <laughs> Improved patient-clinician relationship is a key thing. And I know all of my clinical colleagues, they have a challenge with documentation, with time, having making time to actually really sit down and work on that patient-clinician relationship. To conclude, I think we're at a unique juncture in the history of healthcare with the convergence of EHRs, biosensors, genomics, and other digital advances. We need to make sense of the overwhelming amount of data created. I think there is a remarkable potential for digital healthcare technologies to positively impact care if we get it right. I really think there is. I think we're at a unique juncture. Sometimes we don't always see that, and we have a big opportunity. And we really need to work on this journey together. Patients, clinicians, technicians, nurses, midwives, doctors, all of us um, to get it right. Thank you. the four presenters to join us on the stage can I thank each of them because it's not easy to distill what you did into five minutes that's a skill in itself um, so I have to finish on time because I know our next presenters um, have to leave at a certain time for meetings with the minister so I will open it to the floor though however do we have any questions I'd say we could take two questions from the floor if that's a possibility Derek has one but I'm going to give it to somebody else first unless we're going going there's a lady over there who would like, if I could get a roaming mic to this lady, please. Yeah, sorry, would you mind putting up your hand? Yeah, thank you. Um, hello. I'm just wondering about this from the medical confidentiality point of view. I'd be a little concerned about access to patient summary records rather than the whole record. And I wonder if there'll be an audit trail so that patients can see the full record and know who has accessed their record. I'd also be worried about GP, access to GP data with the care data controversy that appeared in the UK. Um, and I'd also be concerned about whether you're going to segment patient records. I see the value of them and I see the enormity, enormous value for um, many, many patients. I also think research needs to be nurtured, but I do think that if you're bringing patients along, they need to be brought along the whole way. And I just wonder, do you have plans to segment patient data? Because there will be somebody who maybe goes to a psychotherapist and would be upset to find that when they go to ER and they have maybe a sprain in their ankle, they may be concerned to know that the junior doctor in ER has access to their psychotherapy notes. Thank you. Okay. Can I pass that to the panel? He's two roaming mics, so if you just pass it to Jeff, he's going to answer. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so uh, in what we have done, we have segmented it. So what, there's a couple of different options seen internationally. Um, so you can get product delivered directly to the patient's house. We said, no, we don't want that. We want an intermediate uh, from, a, from a company. So that, that is one piece of privacy. For the uh, independent delivery company, which makes the life better for patients, all they have is a, an address, a volume, and they, they know what treatment it is 
from a medication perspective, but they have no other information. And in terms of the other hospitals, um, there's, that's why we use the app in the general hospitals, because we didn't want to give them any patient infor information that was, wasn't relevant. So they use the app to put in the, in, to, put in the uh, to record the treatment, but that's it. So we, we've, we've segmented as much as possible with GDPR that has increased, um, and we've had to put in additional contracts. But it is a fine balance between improving care and uh, uh, privacy. And, and I, I am 100% with you on it. Uh, I, it's just something that we have to be uh, move forward as, as, as carefully as possible. And just as well to say the, the shared care record piece that you're probably talking about is, is the piece that will actually have your information from various sources. Um, colleagues in the Department of Health and the Office of the CIO are looking at that piece and that model isn't quite worked out yet, but there will be like a significant level of patient control in terms of opt-in, opt-out. You will be in control of your information in terms of what you want people to see and if there's something you don't want people to see, that functionality should be there to hide that piece of specific information that you don't want someone to see. I think it's a really important question, your question about, you know, and people, it, again, all of us, because it's not us and them, we have to be confident in how people are managing our data. So I think one of the things we'd say from a technology, well, sorry, I think what's key in all of this is that um, in the same way as medical records, when they're on paper are managed, there's a real, very serious medical record management piece that always has to be underlying all of this, whether it's electronic or paper-based. So the governance of how medical records are managed and the, the safeguarding of those records is huge. So from a technology point of view, once the governance is correct, there's always the, um, the technology really supports this kind of thing in developing what we call role-based access to records, which means that only the people who are involved in particular aspects of a person's care have access to those aspects of the record. Now again, there are other safety issues around that because people may need to have more access to more information, but then there's you know, mechanisms around what we call break glass functionality and things like that in the case of an emergency. So those are really important things. So your question is absolutely bang on in terms of understanding what governance needs to be in place. I think again, from my point of view, one of the advantages of electronic health records and electronic patient portals is what we've built into the, um, what we're working on on the epilepsy patient portal is that people can actually go in and see who has recently accessed their record. Um, so there's an audit trail there of who accessed it, who made a change to it, what change was made and when it was changed. So all of that, that's a great thing about electronic health records is that you can see that. You know, so again, but again, all of those considerations are hugely important in the design and I think that kind of privacy by design, when the whole system, which is not just about the technology, it's about all the people and processes, <coughs> needs to be really very carefully considered. Thank you, Mary. One final question from, from Derek. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course, please. Uh, I just, uh, I, I love this session. I love uh, the fact that we have four people who have been really getting into the nuts and bolts of how we're not only designing and developing uh, patient-centered solutions, but you're, you're really living it. Um, and what, what we hear a lot from patient perspectives is about, well, the, the whole use of technology and the, the advent of the, uh, the patient becoming part of their, their health care uh, by using technology and apps and, and, and different, different ways. But the key piece seems to be the, the interoperability, that, that you have all of these apps that uh, really are not uh, what you might call up to a clinical standard uh, or indeed into what Shane has defined as an open standard. So in terms of that standards piece, it, it seems to me that the standards piece is the patient-centered piece because uh, without the standard, then you're really just collecting data in silos that will never get shared, really. Uh, so I'm just curious as to if that's uh, something that everybody here would support or have you had experience of, of using <coughs> that kind of standards-based approach or, or maybe seen how it maybe hasn't worked in some instances. Um, sorry, I think the coffee is really kicking in. Um, so yeah, one of the things that um, I think was highlighted as, was using apps that were not 
uh, they were, the patients were turning up with apps that are, were not linked in. And that is, uh, a, it, it's a big issue in terms of um, access to the information and, and improving your own care, and you're not quite sure about certain aspects. So one of the things that we had when we introduced the app was, um, we introduced the app, so you scan it and you, your treatment is sent in. So if you indicate that you have had a, a bleed in your head or a bleed in your lower back, it's very important because you can bleed out and die. Um, if you do that, if you have one of those, you get a call within 24 hours. Now, we cannot get the app to tell the patient, go to the hospital or go to treatment, because then it becomes a medical-based uh, treatment uh, device, you're getting into a whole bunch of issues. We also have a nurse in the center whose job it is to monitor patients. So a flag goes up on the system, she um, is in the next morning, and if she's not in, it's directly sent to somebody else within a certain number of hours, and then the patient gets a proper review based on a, a diagnosis of that information that he put in that goes up to the hospital, and then it's the medical team that make that decision. But it's not a medical-based app. So there's ways of thinking about things if you're willing to think outside the box, take the pieces. I'm an engineer by background, so I like to take the pieces apart and put them back together and see what's, in, what's useful, what's not useful, what can we get rid of, um, and really, really optimize the system. And patients have really, really enjoyed it. Now, the nurse who's done it is absolutely wonderful. It is the scariest thing in the world to get a phone call from her because she also does stock management. And she will give you a call uh, and say, um, you know, there's, there's a box that keeps getting pushed to the back of your, your, your uh, uh, fridge. Can you just take that one? Or you've missed a treatment. Um, and it, it, because it comes from a, a person that you know and you've built up a relationship with, you're going, okay, yeah, yeah, fine. If it was to come from an app, no. But there's other parts where I can affect my activity based on the app. The, the, you know, once I drop below 10%, I know what issues I have. So it gives me an indicator, but it doesn't tell me to do anything. And, and that's the difference between in really improving my quality of life uh, and using that sort of logic where you can't use the data directly. So you, you, I think you, it has been highlighted, you need to introduce people into the data um, to, to make it work. Yes, does anyone else want to comment? I think just on that, that particular piece, um, I don't know if anyone has come across a young lady by the name of Molly Watt, mm -hmm. who uh, her mission in life at the moment, she's a lady with Usher syndrome, she's a uh, deafness and retinitis pigmentosa, but her one of her goals is to see what consumer grade electronic equipment and devices and apps and stuff like that is out there that she can use to make her life better. Now she's not doing that from the point of view where she's trying to say, right, this is now a medical device and I'm now going to use this to direct my health care. But it's just, I find this stuff useful and I'm going to use it and make it work. Now those things are gathering data as they go through. So we do need to have that conversation and that thought about how do we gather that information in such a way to actually make people's lives better. Because at the end of the day, although I'm a doctor and I love my patients, I don't want to see them anymore than is necessary, and sure as hell, they don't want to see me any more than is necessary. So there's there's that balance. On that note, yes. Okay, they don't want to see you any longer either because we have to get on to the next one. Can I ask you to put your hands together, please, for Declan, uh, Mary, Shane, and the rest of Thank you very much. Thanks, a million. Housekeeping before uh, the guys finish up here, um, and we'll move to the next session. But uh, what, can I use that? Yeah. Um, so it's traditional to thank people at the end, but I'm going to thank people now because uh, people tend to leave the room at the end. So um, the, the people I'd most like to thank um, are the people who made today happen, and many of them are down in that far corner of the room, and they're the IPOSI team. Uh, I have the pleasure of working with them every day, and they have the pleasure of working with me. <laughs> uh, so I'd just like to first and foremost thank uh, Mel, uh, I'd like to thank Debbie, I'd like to thank Marie, I'd like to thank Laura, I'd like to thank Gemma, and I'd like to thank Brian, who's guest posting today from Arthritis Ireland, and everybody who's been involved in the, in the organization of today. So I think they deserve a rich round of applause. <laughs> This today couldn't have happened without IPOSI resource, but also a number of sponsors. 
and I would sincerely like to thank them uh, today. Um, they uh, are our IPOSI industry uh, members, and many of them are here today, and we can't have days like today without their support, so we're extremely grateful for them. Uh, they're, they're listed in your, in your agenda. It's uh, Pfizer, AbbVie, uh, MSD, uh, Roche, and Janssen. Thank you. Um, so again, thank you so much for that. Uh, there's also one point that I couldn't let today pass without acknowledging somebody who, unfortunately, we recently lost in the e-health community, and that's uh, Seamus Maxivna. Uh, and Seamus was a guy who, if you ever met him, you knew you met somebody. Um, he was a guy who was really leading on the whole mental health uh, side of e-health. Um, and he almost got a bipolar disorder uh, lighthouse over the line. Uh, but we lost him tragically last month, and he would have loved days like today, but I think we have a, an onus on ourselves to continue his legacy. So I knew him personally and from my days in the matter, and he was down in, uh, he was a psychiatrist down in St. Luke's in Kilkenny, but a, a nicer guy you, you, you never met, so I'd just like to acknowledge Seamus's absence in the room today. So. Okay, so if I could ask our final panelists to come up to the stage, uh, those who are in the room. So we have uh, Darren Morrissey of the HRB, uh, no stranger to iPosey. Darren, if you'd like to take a seat. Uh, we have Vincent uh, uh, from, our, uh, from the HSE. We have Laura McGahey from Sloan uh, We have Declan, uh, who is going to join us up on the stage again uh, as our patient rep. And I, do we have Eilish? Eilish has joined us. So. Uh, please come up, Eilish. So we have five chairs, and I'm going to do this without the silly headpiece. Um, okay, so this is our final session. Um, it is what we're calling our, our high-level session, where we get to talk about the policy uh, that will govern how we develop uh, electronic health records in Ireland. Um, and, and really the objectives of, of this particular session is basically an opportunity to reflect but also digest some of the main points that we've been talking about here today and to discuss really the road we have to travel because I think that's, from an IPOSI perspective, that's something we're always interested in, in hearing in terms of what maybe the vision is, but how to, how to get there, how the implementation is going, going to work. Those the key questions that certainly we get asked an awful lot from our patients, from our scientific community and our, and our industry. Um, so I think there was a couple of hints at, uh, I think Vincent, you maybe hinted at a couple of maybe quick wins that are coming down the tracks in the next while uh, in the earlier session. Um, and I'd like to kind of maybe focus on what those quick wins might be in the next period as we move forward. Obviously the people on our panel uh, are coming at this from a number of different uh, perspectives. Uh, Laura McGahey is, is coming from the Slauncher Care Implementation Office. Uh, I seem to recall this time last year, Laura, you were just started in the role, and I think you were at the IPOSI event, uh, and there was a nice tie-in between the patient-centered outcome measures and how EHRs are going to include those, so this is a nice tie-in with last year's. Um, so, Laura, if I could actually start with you uh, in terms of, well, Staunch Care is a vision, uh, and you're in charge of the implementation, and EHRs, I believe, are the first priority in that. Uh, so where, where is that vision hitting the road? Can you hear me? Yeah, you should be able to. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. great. Uh, thanks a million, uh, Derek, and thanks. It's lovely to be back um, a year later. And I think what you, what you asked me to do is to, to maybe have some reflections on... EHR, and I was going to just very, in the first instance, give some personal reflections and then say a bit about where we are very briefly um, in Slaunch Care, uh, together with colleagues in the e-health programme, because they're doing, they're doing all the work. Um, so f I suppose from a personal point of view, I would like my records to be in one place, and I'd like to be able to see my children's records in one place, and I'd like, I know my mother would like to have her records in one place, and we have our bank records in one place, and we have access to that information. And I, feel, you know, speaking just as an ordinary citizen, it would be useful for us all to have our records in one place easily accessible. So 
that's that's the first thing. And then I'm very happy to share my records because I consider them to be my records with clinicians for my safety and uh, to improve my patient um, journey uh, between hospital and community. And I suppose that's what so and for research, about. sorry. And for research, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely for research, because without research and without research having access to data, uh, you can't improve patient outcomes. So com absolutely and completely. So I suppose from from so again from a personal perspective, I believe we need a shared care record as a matter of urgency. So shared care record. I think sometimes perfection is the enemy of the good, and I think we need to, to get to get on and do it. And I know that our colleagues uh, Vincent is here, and they're doing a market engagement. Um, that should be concluded by the end of this year to decide what kind of shared care record we're going to have and to start procuring it next year. And I think that is that is urgent and, and needs to happen with some urgency and is happening. Besides that, there were a couple of uh, commitments in the Solange care, so speaking from a professional uh, perspective. We gave commitment that the IHI office will be set up and that has been set up and the data transfer uh, is happening and is working well. And I suppose they're looking for good projects that they can um, work with colleagues to to make good use of the IHI information. So that's the first uh, commitment that has happened. The second was to begin um, with the e-prescribing project and good progress has been made there. Two pharmacists are being recruited at the moment to lead on it because it's not a tech project, it's a clinically led project that it needs to be. So that's, that's happening again, colleagues in HSE doing that. Um, and third of all, we have commitment to having a demonstration patient portal. And we're on track to having a demonstration patient portal by the end of this year. Now it's a demonstration, it's not a, it, it won't be live because it won't be populated, but it gives us the opportunity to go out and talk to citizens about what they think and uh, what they feel. And I was very glad to hear um, about our nursing colleagues uh, talking about doing uh, patient engagement and clinician engagement around the patient portal. So I think that's very, very important. Um, and maybe just to, to conclude, um, I suppose having uh, citizen involvement is, is critical in any rollout of a uh, shared care record because just going back to what I said at the start, I believe patients are citizens, citizens own their records and as I say, no problem uh, clinicians having access to the records. Uh, so I think we need to go ahead and do this urgently. That's the commitment. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Thanks, Laura. Um, Next, uh, I'm going to introduce the panelists who maybe you haven't seen already. Uh, so next, uh, next to Declan is uh, Eilish Hardiman, uh, no stranger to IPOSI. Uh, uh, Eilish is the Chief Executive of Children's Health Ireland, which is the amalgamated Dublin uh, Children's Hospitals, and as been said by a few Galway people here, a proud Galway woman. Um, and I, I count myself as a proud Galway man. So there's um, the... Uh, Eilish, I think you're you're in a pretty interesting position right now uh, when it comes to EHRs. Uh, we heard from Vincent earlier that the the Children's Hospital EHR has gone uh, out. Well, you're going out to tender, uh, and you're really kind of. It'd be really interesting to see where what your take on maybe the proceedings to date have. Should be okay. Thank you, that's better. Um, yeah, no, great to be here. And uh, yes, so Children's Health Ireland, as you have said, is what well, is only born in the 1st of January this year with the formal amalgamation of the three children's hospitals in Dublin into a single um, entity. Now we have one board, one executive, and working as uh, services, uh, as, as one single organization. Really, we're on a 10-year plan. And it's a transformation plan for children's health care. And uh, that uh, people seem to think that the biggest part of it is the new children's hospital, which actually isn't. What it really is that uh, the evidence internationally is that some services are best delivered in an integrated networked way. Pediatrics is one of those. So is maternity. So is trauma services. So is cancer. So we have um, a plan for over 10 years to actually move to an integrated network of services for children. And remember, children under 18 make up 25% of our population. And as somebody who's gerontology qualified and very key person about older people, fundamentally, if we want to make a serious impact into the health of our nation, 
is that if you can start with healthier children, fundamentally and eventually the adult services will benefit from the fact that uh, the children are a lot healthier. 16% of our children have chronic diseases, which is uh, you know, probably hidden within um, the, the focus, which tends to be an awful lot um, in older people. <clears throat> so from our perspective, we um, are very much working on a policy that's to keep people in the home, if we can't, and my colleagues here to the left have worked beautifully with us on demonstrating how we can do that. Uh, keep them as close to the home as in their community services supported, in their regional hospitals, in their pediatric units if they need to be, and only if necessary then coming to the children's hospital. But the children's hospital has got a remit to ensure that that network is organized and that fundamentally means around data. That means supporting clinicians and parents and children at home, if possible, all through that system to have the data to allow them to make effective decisions at that relevant point of care. So, it's, so we very much feel that um, we want it to be born digital, is how we put it, with the Children's Hospital. And it has taken us a little bit longer time to get there, but glad to say that we went out to market Friday week just to do an uh, announcement with engagement with the market. And we're formally going out on the um, 8th of November for an electronic healthcare record that is for the Children's Hospital and the two paediatric outpatient and urgent care centres that we have in Dublin, but with the fundamental principle of seeing the option as to how this could support a network and very much feed in in a parallel process to what the HSE are doing around the um, integrated capability and shared record process. Um, I would say from a conscious of who I'm speaking to here, um, obviously the Children's Hospital has a triple mission, which is about services, education and research. So we're embedding within the processes to ensure that we can support that, that triple mission. And also we have committed to whereby as part of the selection process, while I very much uh, have a, a fundamental principle of ensuring that the clinicians are engaged in selecting what it is, we actually want parents and children to input to it as well along that part two of that selection process. Because we have found when we put parents and children into the room, sometimes the requirements actually change because the needs are uh, different and it balances out um, some and addresses some sacred cows we might have to address along with that process as well. So, no mean fa task ahead, but um, at least we're on a journey and looking forward to it. Thank you, Eilish. Um, at the end is uh, Darren Morrissey. So uh, Darren is the remaining survivor of last year's panel. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and like I said, so, so Darren is no stranger to us in Iposi and is the CEO of the HRB, but it also in, in previous guises in, in a, a rich career in, uh, in, in industry and uh, is someone who I think is, again, uni uniquely placed to give perspective from a research funder on how this change, uh, as Eilish has said, this, this almost triple uh, aim uh, where research is embedded from the beginning in digital health. Uh, uh, so Darren, what's, what's the story? So yeah, I'm a remnant from last year, and people who remember me from last year will remember the topic was health research regulations. So I've just dry cleaned the suit after the rotten tomatoes that were thrown at me that day. So <laughs> actually, um, it was patient reported outcomes that Darren. <laughs> yes, but but, but we we veered into that line of conversation. But actually, I just as a, as an aside on that, I think today's conversation has actually, for, to my mind, has 12 months on. It's pe people, I think, can start to see the, the sense of health research regu regulations, the improvement that that's gonna have in the system. And um, again, I was really interested to hear Deepak earlier on talking about a very mature system where GDPR compliance is, is, is really important. So I don't wanna open that, that uh, discussion again, but um, interesting to see that evolution. Health research regula er, the, the Health Research Board, um, for people who don't know us, um, we are, I suppose Ireland's primary research funder in the health research space focused on patient care, improving patient care outcomes and improving the health system. And I suppose in that sense, it, we're, we're uniquely positioned to see the needs and the requirements of the system 10 years plus ahead of maybe when, when other entities see it. And certainly el electronic health records has been something that has been on our agenda for a decade plus. Reason being as much as anything is that w we get proposals in, research proposals, you know, to analyze data, to assess data, to link data. 
And the biggest gap in the system quite often is the lack of joined upness and the lack of, uh, I suppose, the ability to link that data together uh, and look at it in an organized joined up way. So we've been quite often trying to put in place band-aid solutions to support research to happen you know, using databases that are just sitting there. So um, in that context, and also in the context of the fact that not only do we um, fund research, but we also do research using information systems that we house ourselves. So again, we're, we're kind of uniquely positioned to see what it takes to actually populate what I would say is clunky databases with, with patient data. So, so at, the, at the moment, we, we house um, drugs and alcohol treatment uh, and, and um, uh, mortality databases. Uh, again, for, for historical reasons, but we do. Uh, we house um, psychiatric inpatient uh, treatment data, and we house disability data as well. Um, and in many respects, that gives us insight into, I suppose, again, the needs of the system, because quite often we're furnishing the HSE with this information to allow the HSE to better plan, to make better decisions. And I will be honest with you, it's based on MOUs and very slow human-to-human uh, -human interaction. Uh, and it's just, it's clunky. So in that context, a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, we, we um, developed a proposal, we, we a, a kind of a policy position statement, which we euphemistically call DAZZLE. Uh, I'm brutal on acronyms, but D stands for data, L stands for linkage, and there's a storage and a sharing and something in there as well, but you get, you get the, 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 the context. Um, so what we've done is in that context, we, we've um, submitted and, and discussed that with, with the Department of Health and certainly they're taking the Dazzle model of uh, data sharing and linkage into consideration when developing the ongoing health information um, policy, which has been developed at the moment, which again is going to feed into decisions taken on IHI and rollout of, of EHR as well. So I suppose that's been our offering into the mix. And I suppose um, we think when you, you know, I won't go into the Dazzle model, but when, when, when you look at it, it's, it's very clear that, again, a lot of the things that Deepak was talking about earlier on, you know, you absolutely need to keep GDPR compliance front of, front of mind. You absolutely need to keep um, patient considerations front of mind when developing EHR and developing the research uh, potential outputs for it. Um, and you need to build for a, a dynamic system and a linked system. So again, there are some of the principles uh, that, that we put on the table and that we expect are, are steering decision-making at a departmental level. Thank you, Darren. Um, I'm going to, to ask maybe Vincent and, uh, and Declan to maybe contribute at, at this point. I mean, Vincent, have you, uh, in terms of how maybe we've reacted to, okay, so you, have, you presented earlier and we got a chance to discuss with you. Is there any other kind of insights that maybe you could? Oh, you well, could maybe one, Derek, is um, there's no wins in this business, okay? Um, all of the wins come from a lot of hard work from, from multiple stakeholders working together. And, and I think that the approval that emerged out of government for the work that is underpinning the Children's Health Ireland initiative has been the result of a lot of people coming together to get that over the line. Um, the, the specific initiatives that I spoke about were really um, um, things that will demonstrate value in the short term for um, the participants in those initiatives, both the, the patients and the people that deliver care, but it will inform how we go about and how we construct a much more systematic and widespread solution <laughs> that um, Laura mentions we'll be going to market for. Okay, So I think that the, if, if I look back at the, the, the values of the organization, care, compassion, trust, and learning, um, some of the key things within the EHR development program are about the learning. We heard about the trust issues that are really essential to good quality care between the individuals that live with conditions and the people that provide care services for them. But the, the, the learning work that we've got underway right now is going to inform what we do at a systematic level. And we cannot take a single leap into that perfect future. We've got many steps along the way, and we need to learn from each other through that process. And I think the diversity of stakeholders, including now people that are um, um, patients, um, they can bring a perspective that, as Eilish has said, can, can really ground the discussions in things that will make a difference to people that are looking for high quality, safe and effective healthcare services. So I think that today's a very useful way to 
actually um, uh, continue the dialogue. That dialogue is um, starting to be more engaging, I think, for people that are looking for high quality services. Um, and I, I think we've got plenty of work in front of us, but I do think we've got lots of really, really good work underway and many really good deliverables along the way as well. So it's, it's very encouraging. Thanks. Thanks, Vincent. Declan, to finish off the prepared answers. Prepared answers. Oh, I was supposed to prepare answers. <laughs> um, so I, th I think there's, for, for me, there's a, there's a couple of things. One is there's a really good uh, there, there's really good GDPR compliance. I don't necessarily believe there's really good GDPR understanding. Um, when we talk, when we talk about, when it, I've talked to clinicians, uh, they were saying that uh, I, I was putting together a survey, and um, they asked me to put a question on uh, across all of Europe to say, is GDPR interfering with your ability to collect data on, on your patients to to improve treatment? And that's that's. That comes from a misunderstanding rather than a, a compliance issue, uh, and that's that's something that I, I, was, I was a little bit surprised at. Um, so one of the other issues that I have I have seen come up is the we, we I think it was highlighted earlier on is we have good clinical measures and they go in generally speaking, uh, we have good quality of life measures they go in clinically. Well, you can get them in. It takes a bit more effort. We've seen them. In a lot of cases with the treatment or with the measures that we're using, we tend to get stuck with a little bit of ceiling effects. So the improvement can be difficult to prove. Um, so say for example, we, like we switched to this from, a, from one product to another, it was um, a significant reduction in uh, bleeding rate, which was a clinical outcome. There was a significant reduction in the number of infusions per patient, which is a clinical outcome. There was a, a minor improvement in terms of quality of life, so that makes advocacy really, really difficult. But one parent stood up and said, okay, there's a 52 injections less a year, my child has needle phobia, I have to hold them down 52 less times a year. I can't put that anywhere, nowhere. And I, and I can't prove that the drug is effective and benefits the patient in terms of improved quality of life because the data that I do have says there's no difference. Yeah. And I think those are the sort of things where when we're thinking about patient registries, we need to think about the qualitative side and how we get that qualitative data in and record that as well. And I've got a bunch of other things as well, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. Well, I think that speaks very well to maybe what Vincent was talking about in terms of the patient experience and certainly in terms of the health-related quality of life data and how that can be more incorporated into EHRs, I think is certainly speaking very loudly today. Um, thanks, Declan. So, I know I've got the mic, but we've got time for Q&A. So if there's, particularly I think over in this side of the room, there haven't have been too many questions, but if anybody does have a burning question, uh, Pamela, I'll go to you first. Um, see any just yet, and Colin after that. So Pamela's there. Thanks to everybody for a great day. Pamela Hussey, DCU. I just want to make a couple of comments, if that's okay, to everybody. Um, I think we're right about the critical infrastructure needing to be in place, and I've heard that a lot this afternoon and this morning. Um, and I do agree with Vincent that we can take leaps, for sure. But I do think that we need, with my patient hat on here, um, to be very mindful that we don't limit our vision of where we need to go. And what worries me sometimes is the models that we are now looking at on the screen, the conceptual models. What I really like to say, Darren, is I was delighted to see that you have the house on your conceptual model, and it's well, it's well established there in terms of it starts at home. Um, and I think from an architecture perspective, that's very important. Yes, we are starting with an EHR procurement for the Children's Hospital, but for God's sake, let's, forget, let's not forget how far health has come in the last five years. In the next five years, everybody in this room will have five to 10 devices hanging in their home or on their person. Thank you. Thanks, Pamela. I will probably take Colin's question and then maybe put it to the panel. <coughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Um, Colin Doherty, I'm from St. James's Hospital. I'm a colleague of Orla's and I've been working in the epilepsy arena for about 15 years as well. Um, it seems about all that time since I got involved in e-health, 
initiatives, I've opened to general audiences with the statement, something along the lines of, we thought it would be a good idea to get everyone's records, put them on a computer so that we could share them with each other. And that usually goes down like a lead balloon. Because <laughs> well, are we not doing that already? You know, and I suppose the question I have is a hard one for the panel, uh, whoever wants to take it. You're not allowed to use the term. I'm going to ask you, what's the biggest, what's the most important reason why we're not further along than we are now? And you're not allowed to use terms like, it's hard. And, we, you know, the data's all mixed up and it's all in different silos and it's, you know, and the GDPR. You're not allowed to use any of those terms. Give me something original. Because and you can come back to me if you want. And you're not allowed to talk about Brexit either. And you're not allowed to talk about Brexit, yeah. So why are we still here? This one doesn't oh, it does work. Okay, um, uh, if I may, and it was a little bit Pamela to your earlier point, because uh, uh, I totally share your frustration, um, Colin, with this one, whereby we'd expect to be an awful lot on an awful lot earlier. So I'm six years in this job next month, and I started five years ago saying, you know, on the 24th of September, we appointed a design team to build, to design the hospital. And I was talking at that stage, we have also got to be designing our um, electronic, dig to be born digital. It has taken us five years to get approval. So I would be saying one of the challenges we have is the pace and rate that technology is going at is, is actually quite scary. So, and, and if I give you a little side story, we've held up even in designing the, um, audio and visuals of the theater because we wrote it into our brief five years ago and it has changed twice since before we've even got the place so it is just we're experiencing this but we do not have an agile i think approvals process that actually allows us to move with the pace of technology now i've been there i was part of the peepers project when i was in james's i understand the need probity I appreciate the requirements that a business case needs to be developed. I totally get all of that. But the process that it goes through are, are, are quite laborious. So I've spent the last three hours in a peer review still going through what it is we're doing. And I understand why we need to do it, and it's quite helpful. But if I go back into one of the things that we have found the most challenging is that are we investing or are we doing a return on investment? Because I'm constantly been asked, to take your point, Pamela, to monetize the benefits. And it's extremely different to monetize some of the better. Some of them you can monetize, like patient safety and drugs um, errors and uh, you know, ability to actually uh, catch patients at risk you know, earlier, and you kind of do that. But some of them are very difficult to actually monetize. And I just wonder if we uh, should be looking at you know, very well-proven, well-established international systems, and how can we look at effectively demonstrating that they're still worth m money, because it's taxpayers' money, but the approvals process, I think, needs to be a little bit smoother and easier, because I can see myself for the next three years, you know, experiencing like the three hours that I went through today, which is positive, but at the same time, it's all of these gateways, and I think I'd have four different masters that we need to do to make some decisions. So clarity around some of the decisions, uh, smoothness around some of the approvals, and we have got to actually work with the government, and this is where um, Laura, I would say, in, in Slauncher Care, about understanding the digitization of health. It's fundamental in today's contemporary healthcare, and I don't think that understanding is necessarily there, so being able to advocate and influence and constantly try to push for that. So is that different enough for you, Con? <laughs> <laughs> I'm building it. <laughs> um, Follow that. I'm just kind of taking that lead. For me, you asked for something that you know, an explainer. For for me, it's political understanding. Um, picture this: I was in an audience like yourself three weeks ago at the launch of the Health Research Charities in, um, uh, Group (MRCG) as were, and on a panel like this, you had four politicians. And this is not a polit political comment because there was four politicians from from government and from opposition. <coughs> And there was a really interesting discussion about uh, the future of health research and health data was perceived to be really, really important in that context. And there was one individual, we'd say politician one to four, politician, politician one, one opened up the, um, the by, by commenting, but by the way, all health spokespeople, so, so all focused on health, by commenting about how important health data was and how mad it was, to your point, that we'd be talking about joining the dots on e-health and, you know, and databases and all that, um, and access to data for decades and how isn't it on yet. 
So the, it went to politician two who commented, yeah, that's true. However, you know, there is a risk in security and uh, per personal privacy and so, so on. It went to another uh, politician who spoke about the risk of, um, and I'm going to quote, pharmaceutical companies getting their hands on that data and what's to become of the world. And the fourth politician then spoke about PPARs. And then the first politician at the end of it said, oh, that they're all good points. Maybe I'm, I've overstated. So for me, there is a lack of understanding. And actually, as I look, as I project myself up to, to being on a panel, we're at fault for those four politicians not being on message in terms of the value. It's on us. And for me, that is a project that we need to kind of get right because I don't think there's a level of understanding, not, not the no level of comp political will. And when the tough decisions get to, to, to be made, they feel, I suppose, ill-equipped to make those big judgment calls and those big decisions. That would be my view. I would probably add to that in saying that it's not just the politicians who need to be uh, brought along, but the patients and the patient communities. Mm. The politicians will be listening far, far better to the likes of the patient community coming together around a, a particular it, it, topic. It, it, it's, uh, yeah, you're so right. And actually, where that landed, that discussion ultimately landed was talking about I suppose political manifestos and why health and health research doesn't often feature in a kind of a positive and proactive sense. Uh, it, you know, it's always quite defensive. And then there was a discussion about, well, how do you make it a, door, a doorstep issue? And then it got around to talking about patients. So actually, you're, you're absolutely right. Mm. Uh, there's a couple of other questions. Uh, Sarah, if you want to jump in there, there's a microphone right next to you. Oh. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks a million for your contributions. They were really interesting. Um, just speaking to your point, Darren, about us all failing on that level, um, I'm the CEO of the Asthma Society of Ireland. And uh, when I meet patients, um, whether they're respiratory patients or not, I hear a degree of frustration from people who, for example, um, in the case of asthma, may have had to materialise at their local accident and emergency room um, at four o'clock in the morning with a child who's sick, for example, or with an with a parent who's sick, and they'll go to their GP a number of weeks later, and that GP may or may not have had some correspondence to realize that that person has been treated at hospital. Um, the patient, of course, in today's iPhone age, will imagine that the, the doctor knows that they have actually had a very serious um, uh, escalation of their symptoms. And as a result, the patient gives a partial report because they are under the impression that the, their GP knows more than they know. And the emergency situation will have been dealt with for that 24 hours, but there'll have been no scale or change of the care that the patient needs on a day-to-day -day basis in the case of asthma to get their asthma control back. And I suppose for me, when I hear the concern about security and privacy, I think that's really, really important and we always have to bear that in mind. But I think the problem is nobody is saying to those patients, well, actually, this is why we have to invest in e-health. It's so that somebody knows and it can facilitate the right conversation. It's not about moving to robots. It's actually about making sure that you can have an informed conversation on both ends in terms of what your recent outcomes or what your results have been. And I suppose speaking, um, Vincent, to your point earlier on about the personas, I was really interested to see those because I think um, th you know, people can dismiss them as marketing wonk, but actually in reality, if you're able to say to somebody, look, this is the fractured, disintegrated um, situation you have at the moment with your healthcare and how you interact with the healthcare system, and here's what technology can offer. So I'd love to see a presentation which said, look, here's what we think those personas can look like, whether it's through uh, Children's Health Ireland, through your local regional hospital um, and that people would have a, a better tangible real sense as a patient um, uh, and we are all patients now so I find this idea of us talking about patients which exist over there and aren't every single one of us in this room as an odd concept but um, I'd just love to know if you think how we can do that in a tangible real way. Great question. Um, either Laura or yeah. yeah. Thanks Sarah. Um, well Part of Staunch Care's commitment is to have a major citizen um, and staff engagement program, and one of the topics we would um, intend to roll out in through next year is around e-health and exactly what you're talking about. And the opportunity exists because we're going to be planning um, integrated areas, six regional integrated areas. <coughs> so part of the design of that would be a, a co-design with citizens who are also patients, as you rightly say. Um, so that is the intention, is, is to absolutely highlight, in particular, e-health and the role that it can play. I think somebody else made the point of, you know, it starts in your home, trying to keep you well at home, and um, your community, the information that GPs has is magic. I think Orla was making that point earlier. 
Um, and, and it's a matter of trying to join these data sets together and, and make the most of those data sets. And I think to your, to your point um, about why, why isn't it happening quicker, I think very often these things are two-legged problems. They're because people you know, are guarding information and, and don't see the benefits of actually collaborating and sharing information. And that has been, that has been the case. There are lots of data sets there and we need to break down um, the barriers between hospital, community, GPs, we've PCRS, there's lots of different data and we need to share the data and come to some kind of data sharing agreement for the benefits of the patients and the citizens and it's something we need to do urgently. So that's, that's why I think it doesn't happen. PPARs, yes, is one thing and, you know, and things do move slowly and things have got to be done properly and procured properly but actually getting data agreement and getting shared data agreement is, is, is down to people, down to two-legged problems in my view. Declan, do you want to come in? I'm trying to figure out how controversial I want to be. Um, <laughs> Feel free. <laughs> come on. No, 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 no you are, you are. I, 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 just, I, just want, I just wanted to wrap it up. Um, no, I, I entirely agree. I think it is a two-legged two problem. Um, it, I, I think it's, it's the incentives. It's not incentivized correctly. That's the problem. It's, so if you're, if you're and I, I, I know you're a clinician, so I'm going to be um, very gentle here. Um, so... Clinicians internationally, you, you advance your career by producing data. So you guard that data. That's a perfectly natural thing to do. Um, then you have uh, information in the centers trying to get the data into the thing in the first place. You, a major issues in terms of funding to pay for database managers, etc. You have issues around the access to the data. You have issues around uh, funding models, all of these different things. So one of the so I, I'm, if anybody hasn't realized, I am an absolute data nerd. So the way that many things are working and the way that many things are moving in, in the direction, I've been working with the EMA on, on a concept where you don't have, you don't, not necessarily do, you don't use clinical uh, trials registries. So you have clinical trials and they have their own registries and that goes somewhere else. And you can't put that in with the regular registry. But, and then we can't find out new information on, on the current drugs. So we have, we, we have all of these different aspects, and all of them can be identified through um, really, really easy little approaches. And there's a really interesting program called OR. For, um, it's, a, it's an open source statistics program. You don't need access to the data, because access to the data is a big problem. You need access to the coding that describes the data, and then you can write the code, you can ask the question, you never get access to the data, it's completely anonymized, you don't get any information, and you get the question that you get back. Now, one of the pieces that I've seen in Netherlands recently is they said, we can't afford it, we can afford half it. So they got the company to, to comp all of the companies to put money into the pot for a centralized uh, to fund the other half, which is, which is great, but then you're worried about, do the companies get access? The companies don't get access, but the clinicians get uh, portions of that pot in each hospital in order to get uh, f a database managers to make sure that the information is correct. So I think the answer is there's tons of registries out there. You have to incentivize them to put in the, in the information correctly, coded correctly, and that's how you move forward. And that's how you, you, you redirect funding that goes into, generally speaking, uh, outside trying to get drugs approved and trying to get them into the market and you can redirect them into the databases that are actually going to make a huge difference to the people that are supposed to be using them. And then you have to use the same incentives or, well, different incentives with patients to say why you want to put this data in. And it's a balance again. I don't want to put my data in on a regular basis. I wear a Garmin watch on a regular, no, that's not promotional, I wear a, a, a watch that uh, monitors my steps. That watch can also monitor my cadence. It can monitor if I'm having a bleed then. So it can passively collect that information and put it in and, and I don't need to do anything. There, there are bits I need to do, but I need to get something back as well because I, like, I've, been, I've been filling in surveys for 30 years and they sit in things and they don't know where they're going. Incentivize it the right way for patients, for clinicians, for hospitals, for uh, pharma and for the government, and that's when you get it to move. Darren, and then we'll go to a question from John. Yeah, that you talk incentives, just as an aside, but it's, I think it could be an important one. We, we've recently run a call, the 
the secondary data analysis call, which is you know, typically HRB language for, but um, in, in essence what it is, it's, it's trying to incentivize uh, people research questions to, to, to link databases, to go out and, and utilize existing databases. Now, when EHR is up and running and where it's up and running, it becomes a very easy and simple prospect. But in this particular instance, we're just about to fund seven projects. And what's really notable about the projects, I can't say, there's probably applicants in the room here, can't say what they are at the moment, but what I can say is that there are notable, what I would say is HSE and health system databases that really have been never accessed for research purposes before. That's the first thing. So incentives put in place, MOUs put in place to allow open access um, or relatively open access. The second thing is to the point of impatience and, and I suppose general public, in, in all of those projects, we, we incentivized the projects to engage with patient groups at the, at the I'm going to say at the receiving end of that research to, to uh, in terms of asking the question and what we call PPI, patient and, 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 um, and people involvement, so we incentivize that piece as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it can be done, it's small tranches of funding, but it's easy enough to scale that principle up, particularly if the infrastructure is there. And the and Darren, the Dazzle model call, any progress on that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's an award. Okay, <laughs> again, we, uh, we ran a, a call to develop the Dazzle model, which is, is to your point about coding, it's a, it's a safe haven uh, for linkage of data so that you know one never needs to see the data. Um, uh, and what we, we we're about to pay out an award on that particular uh, award as well to one pilot project, and again, I can't announce it today, there's contractual stuff going on, but what's gonna happen there, it's a, I think a two or three year project, I'm looking at my colleagues there, three, two, two year project to set, set put in place um, a safe haven for linkage of, of data, and, and out of the back of that, there'll be a number of projects done that will prove print the, the, the principle, and again, our view would be that Department of Health, HSE, there will be some investment in that going forward uh, at some point. Okay. I'm, I'm Okay. In terms of the reviews, are there patients involved on the review panel? Yes, but not. I don't believe on either of those two calls, but we, we do on other calls, and our ambition is, and we had this conversation last year actually in the room, um, we're, we're switching on more and more calls for that PPI involvement, uh, but it's critical, and we're on, we're on a path to do that. Okay, John. Go ahead. Uh, Derek, I, I hesitate to throw a hand grenade in at this hour of the, of the day, but you mentioned yourself uh, that the patients have, uh, have a lot to do in this, and I think we ought to look at ourselves, uh, the patient organizations, uh, very sharply. Uh, we are probably the most siloed group in this spectrum. We come to together sometimes in events like this. We come together sometimes in the training that IPOSI has, has organized. We sometimes operate on an ad hoc basis in certain kinds of umbrella groups. But in terms of the wider spectrum of the patient world, we are the most fragmented group. And we tend to be very territorial. And, on, and we, have to, we have to really take that on the chin, and we get our act together over time. We have to use organizations like I pose you. We may have to set up new organizations. Um, we, are, we are often so divided that we can be disregarded, and we're not doing ourselves any favors. Uh, we have to work with the clinicians, and we have to work with the bogeymen, be they be they the, the pharmaceutical companies or be they the politicians. Uh, but we have to speak with some class of united voice. If we're all going to paddle our own canoes, we may find ourselves going nowhere. Thank you, John. Derek, can I add to that? Would you mind? If yeah, I, and I think I'll, it's I'll really with, resonating yeah. with me at the moment because yeah. we are genuinely trying to see how do we involve children and parents in our decision making. And I, I would concur with you because we tend to go out, as we know, I'm, I know people in the audience to advocacy groups, we tend to go out to 
members who maybe have families who have complained and said, I want to be a part of making this a difference in the future. And we are struggling at the moment how to do it. So we, we have gone out and we have got children who have been using our services to come and be part of a youth advisory um, council, YAC. And they're great because between them, they have over 100 years of experience of hospitalization. And we go out and we recruit within that, within our hospitals for that. We're trying to, we're actually going um, next week to try to pull a family forum, which is trying to get families, and we're using families because it's more than parents, because with us it's grandparents and it can be foster parents involved. And how do we get families involved and where they want to do it? And we are coming up against people who can be coming with a single item versus us trying to understand how do we, and it's a real struggle for us. So I would say as healthcare providers who genuinely are interested in putting, in our case, the child-centered family focused, we're also struggling about how to do that. So I would welcome any sort of good thoughts about how to make that happen. Thank you. Well, we would certainly have lots of thoughts, Eilish, uh, how you can make that happen. Um, the there's, yeah, I'll go with Jackie first and then Loretto, if that's all right. Yep, no problem. Um, a couple of thoughts, and, uh, just a very short one, and I want one question, if I may, for the panel. Um, in response to John, I hear you loud and clear, John. All I would say is that, first of all, patients don't have money. Um, and a lot of patients, because of their um, maybe illnesses, conditions, or otherwise, sometimes are, are exhausted, and they need the support of organisations or groups to facilitate their training and skills, a bit like you said about Ipoji. Uh, uh, so I, um, I absolutely agree with you, though. We, those of us who can and on the days we can, yes, let's go forward and let's work together. We have more in common than we don't have in common. Um, coming back to your question, Rona, I think sometimes we ourselves, and I say we in the uh, uh, full sense of that meaning, uh, we fall into the trap of being and operating in our own silos because there's a national family forum out there, National Community Development Family Forum. So, you, you know, I think we're not using existing mainstream. Mm -hmm. I, I can give you the contact details. They're in operation for over 50 odd years. They're completely rooted in the community all around the country. And you have very good, solid reps that come through the community structure. So that's your natural place to go to, rather than looking up to set up and actually to start. Now, my question is, if any of you, I uh, don't know if Vincent will be the person, is while all this work is going on and looking at different calls and databases and integration systems, is someone in the background or even in parallel working on the legal side and the potential for stumbling blocks? I mean, all we have to think about is the public services card problem. Um, are we going to run into the same problem when we think we have the right technology which apart from it's going to be out of date as soon as it's delivered anyway. So I think that's really important that we start looking at that now. And what are the implications of all this when you look at FOIs and how difficult it is for people to get access to the data as it is? And I'm saying that based on personal experience. Okay, so um, just, just um, there's, there's a number of pieces to that, Jackie. Um, I think the in terms of us having to work on multiple threads at once, absolutely. And there's a lot of work going on to make sure that we um, what we do is compliance with the legislation where we identify things that are in patients' interests and the legislation doesn't support it. We work closely with the department to bring that through. We've in, been engaged in quite a detailed way across the HSE with the department on the new statutory instrument I mentioned a little bit earlier, which underpins how data can be safely shared. I think GDPR is a really good example where the intent of that was it would support good quality and appropriate information sharing. And what I've heard at least twice now in other forums is, if you ever want to stop anything, you throw the rotting carcass of GDPR on the table, okay? And, and that, that has tended to be the, the kind of the defense mechanism. Maybe back to John's point, this is as fragmented as it gets. I have to say that one of the issues that has prevented, I guess, the ED presentation being communicated back to GPs in an early way was a, an initiative that went on for a couple of years and then the wheels fell off the wagon in 2011 because the clinicians couldn't get to a consensus on how to move forward. There was a few different stakeholders in that, and that set that program back six years. Okay, So there's, there's a whole range of things where we need to try and marshal on many fronts to move forward together. I think it's important to recognize that um, I think the, the, the funders and the stakeholders here, a lot of it is about the public, 
a lot of it then is representative and the you know the politicians that bring that through and i think working on that agenda is really important um, if I briefly try and answer Colin's question, if you don't mind, Derek, one of the challenges we've had is the ICT investment has been about 0.9% in terms of the, the health budget. Um, that has moved over the last three years to just 1.1%. Um, um, health systems in Europe are tending to spend between 2 and 3%, and in the US, in excess of 4%. Okay, so that's... We, we've got um, we've got a, a significant underfunding, which is a manifestation of the problem. It's not the problem. The manifestation of the problem, I think, is what we've we've spoken about here. That actually, how do we value some of these investments over and above the home help hours? That you know, m many of us have um, family dependents, mm -hmm. and you know, in some respects, when we have to have the engagements that Eilish has had today with public expenditure and reform. Many of them stand beside us, but the people that control the purse say, well, I, I, um, you know, here's the value proposition for the motorway. You know, um, I'm looking at Neil here, we're about to spend 800 million euros on a bridge. I was in the library in Galway on Saturday and all of the financial ana analysis was in there. And there's a very straight line between we build this road and this is the economic uplift that we should expect. We don't have that connection, okay? And that's why we continuously see um, a challenge in getting the investments that will help us move forward. And that's often because we're trading investments in IT against home help hours, okay? And that's a real tough space. I think, as I said earlier, the Solange Care vehicle actually allows us to do some things in a joined up way and in a long-term way, which is a wonderful opportunity. And we're working with Laura to make sure we deliver on our parts of that. So I think that that's very helpful. But um, Jackie, I'm not sure if that, if that helps but there's multiple fronts that we need to work on. And, and I guess as, as a technologist, what I find very valuable is when I do encounter people that depend on our programs for the kind of care they need. And the care they need is, as Sarah says, they need to be understood, they need to be listened to, they need somebody to know that they've had an episode in hospital, okay? And actually the healing process is that process. And what we do and what we talk about in terms of research outcomes and the data that can underpin that it is actually about how does it underpin that healing process. And that, I think, is what we aspire to ourselves and for our families. And that's, that's a um, wonderful place to work in, but it's very, very challenging to, to achieve that. Okay. Um, I know that both Laura and Eilish have to meet the minister, is that correct? Or Eilish, are you <coughs> still here for another 15 minutes? Or? Could we have um, one final question? I, you know how I love to keep the minister waiting, but Loretto, if you want, uh, you've been waiting patiently. No, I was actually just, uh, John, you say about how patients are, are siloed. I can tell you many clinicians are also siloed in terms of their areas. They're working in acute or they're working in mental health or they're working in, in public health in Donegal. So all of their thinking in terms of their data is siloed. And Sloan Care has done a huge amount already, even in the last year, to just kind of lift up that thinking about, you know, that data and that meaning for the patient. So it's not just patients that are siloed in terms of that digital conversation. Clinicians are also very siloed. And we haven't always been great at building that capacity to kind of unleash some of that in, in the health service. And we are starting to address that, but it's a significant issue. Okay. I think one kind of point I'd like to... Oh, sorry, I didn't yeah. see you, Sheila. Go ahead. Can I just, just uh, one other thing I would like to say is that, um, you know, in relation to recruiting patients and consulting with patients, I think the practicalities were not always attended to. I mean, certainly as somebody who has done a number of consultations in the last uh, 18 months, um, you, you know, you arrive in the room, you're the only one who's unpaid in the room, uh, helping the system along in its journey of improvement and then when it comes to reimbursement of expenses you're left waiting six months because they discover at the last minute there isn't actually a system to reimburse your, uh, your expenses and then it drags on. So I think there are, in terms of recruiting people to come in, patients, uh, many of poor patients cannot in be engaged with the system at all because they simply can't afford that sort of wait delay. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're often people with, with 
but Michaela Nesbitt are also, uh, you know, poorer as a result of the illness. And they simply can't do that. And I worry about the way that skews the voices among the patient community that are heard. You know, I think that, it, you know, it tends to be people who are better off, who live in Dublin, and um, who are older and have the time. You know, so you are never, you're not getting a representative patient voice because of those factors. Well, I certainly think that the minister's recent announcement is something to uh, be very favorable towards, certainly from an IPOSI perspective, uh, and we are preparing a position on that uh, in terms of re remuneration of patient advocates. It's, um, I think there's one other question. Yes? Yeah. Good afternoon. Thank you to the panel for your talks. Um, just a couple of points there, really. Um, I think the collective leadership that we hear complaint about, particularly tying into the political level when you're struggling for appropriation of funds and things like that. Um, I understand it is the case, but moving forward with the Schlante Care and the Integrated Care Programme, we'd like to hear less of it, if we could at all, <laughs> to go back to that man's points and how you answered the challenging questions. Because I think to evolve from where we have been and to draw a line under it and to look forward and come together, we shouldn't even be addressing the fact that we have patient silos. The reason why we're addressing it is because we are still competing for, and it is a competitive mindset based in pharma and around budgets. But in integrated care, surely that is what it, we are hoping to uh, get rid of. So I suppose how we move forward with that ideology that no, we're not silos anymore. We have to tell ourselves we're not silos anymore. We have to behave like as if we're not silos anymore. There's no difference between a patient or a public person, exactly as was said here many, many times. You know, so I think in some ways we're talking about stuff that I hope and really believe and work very hard at uh, looking to know has been rather than will, I hope, will not be in the future. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, okay, I think that's uh, as good a note to, 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 to end on as possible. I did, I, one aspect which I hoped we might reach to, and maybe we'll do it in a follow-up, is um, several times people have referred to companies and uh, to industry as if uh, industry shouldn't be playing a role in this. And I think that we really do need to have a national conversation about that because it's very obvious to someone like myself that particularly in the, in the data field, that we are going to have to ask some serious questions about who we think is going to be doing this kind of work. Uh, because certainly, I think from, we, we've acknowledged that the state has a certain responsibility. <laughs> but if you really want the innovative new products and solutions, you have to design a system that encourages that innovation. And that innovation has, will come from private sector, large, medium, and small companies. Uh, and you have to bring them along with, with the system, because otherwise, it, it just won't work. Um, so that's something that I'm very posy to think about for uh, a next uh, event. But I'd like to thank our panelists for, for a very, very good discussion, I have to say. Um, probably exceeded my expectations as to how we can actually get a high-level panel really talking about serious and uh, things that really matter to patient communities. So thank you, everybody. And, and thank you all for coming. We're breaking early. It's 4 o'clock. Uh, wish you all a safe home, and we'll be in touch with all the outputs and results. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.